Uh, good evening and welcome back to the Thursday, March 28th, uh, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, the school committee is returning uh, to open session from an executive session that we just held uh, that began at 6 p.m. And I wanted to just announce that uh, <coughs> Uh, in executive session, the school committee did vote to approve and release uh, minutes of executive session for January 10th, 2013 and January 17th, 2013. Uh, so the clerk will be uh, making those available as soon as she uh, converts them from draft form to final approved form. Uh, so now uh, we have on next item on our agenda uh, for this regular meeting is a discussion regarding the uh, superintendent uh, search process. And I don't know if you would like to uh, open that up or begin that discussion. Uh, I seem to have put my agenda somewhere off. I think I left, I think it got scooped up. Um, yes, okay. So the purpose of this, you may recall that at our last meeting there, uh, the committee voted to accept the resignation and it indicated that we wanted to try to carve out some time for the school committee to meet uh, to, to really begin a preliminary discussion of the search process. And so in trying to figure out if we could find a separate date, that was challenging to try to do that. So we thought we would start the meeting a little bit earlier and carve out some time for a discussion, half hour, 45 minutes um, at that time. And so one of the issues, we also asked that the clerk include with it a copy of the previous posting um, and the previous job description, which you should have been sent uh, uh, prior to this meeting as well. Um, and, we do, and we do have copies of that, because we thought that that might be a, a, um, uh, a way to help frame the discussion and, and talk about what the way forward would be, et cetera. So I don't know if you want to add to that, Mr. Vice Chair, or? I don't, other than to remind you that this came up at the very end of our last meeting, and because of that, um, it was late into the evening, and we thought that by uh, starting our meeting with it this evening, we might have uh, a fresher approach at it, and we could set forth a, a timeline and get some ideas to the direction that um, we'll be taking over the next few months as we search uh, for a new superintendent. Um, unfortunately, I would say that we've been through this uh, procedure uh, you know we've been through it recently and so for many of us it's pretty fresh in our minds and there's fresh information out there and we know the the procedure and many of us were here on the committee so um, with all of that said um, I open it up to the floor for any ideas that you might have as far as a timeline and how you might want to use some of the old information that we've accumulated if you think uh, it's necessary to go through all the steps that we went through so recently uh, in, the, in the near past and what we can do for next steps to fill the vacancy of the superintendency. I just wanted to add I know that in looking at the last j job description that prior that we did have a an outside consultant who was managing the process last time in terms of managing the incoming applications and working with the committee, uh, the interview process, et cetera. I did want to say to the school committee that I have uh, consulted with our HR department and they are prepared if called upon to help manage that process and manage those applications and that's a function they do all the time to work with the search committee. So if, if in fact the it was the school committee's interest in moving forward more expeditiously uh, with with a posting that they could manage that process if that's the way the school committee wanted to, to proceed. Did you, I, I um, thought I interrupted you. Yeah, so, um, two things. One is, um, I think the first thing that we need to talk about is if we're, look, if we're looking to um, hire a permanent superintendent or if we're looking for an interim. And Definitely. that has, uh, so we have to talk about timing and what, what, we, what we have the time to do, what we can afford to do and all of that. But the other thing that I just wanted to raise is what I remember from the end of our last meeting is that we had talked about having a special meeting with the administrators to be able to discuss this with them and be able to get their feedback. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering how we're going to be able to do that. Uh, I, I think, well, obviously we have some administrators here, but we don't, we don't have the administrative leadership team. Right. Um, again, 
that's not something we have to any kind of a meeting like that has to be held in open session it's not yes. something no, we can no, have I a, understand yeah that. I thought so we can certainly do that um, and we can certainly seek their input uh, but I I guess we wanted to have a discussion and not wait till late April early May and then um, have a very compressed time frame so if that's one of the takeaways of tonight that we need to have that more intensive discussion that's fine I mean another possible discussion in either event is do we have a search committee whether it's an interim or a, or a full superintendent I don't know what the past process has been just to follow up to, and given um, the um, kind of the breadth of the news that we've had this week and the changes in the administrative team that are coming upon us I think it's going to be really important to hear from the people especially who are staying and how what, what's going to be most supportive for them as well your point is well taken. Any other comments about that, Ms. Minnick? Um, the first thing I have to say that I heard was um, whether or not we need a search committee for an interim. I don't think we've ever done anything like that in the past. I think there are, I, I think it's, it's a discussion that we would have, but I'm not sure we need to actually follow some kind of a formal search process to hire an interim. Um, Given the timing, uh, the notification and the superintendent's, you know, exit date, I think we're right on the fair edge of being able to find a permanent superintendent replacement. And I'm really cautious that we wouldn't rush that decision. I'd rather take the time and do it in a more considered way. And I think, I mean, I think we're just um, like, a month to six weeks behind where we should be if we were going to have somebody begin you know on August the 1st so so from my perspective I would say that we should be considering an interim superintendent August the 1st and a search beginning sometime and the question is only whether we would look for a superintendent that could come in mid-year and that's not impossible to find but it's much less common that you find a superintendent coming in at the middle of the year that's usually at the, at the changeover of the fiscal year because that coincides with the school calendar it gives it gives a superintendent a month or so before school starts in the fall to get things going so I mean uh, it, I recognize that 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 eventuality means that we're looking at an interim for as much as a year. Was so it? I, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm, framed, I'm trying to help. Stephanie was talking about what she thought the issues were, and I'm trying to help frame that discussion okay. a little bit. Is there any other questions about that? I mean, and I'm, I guess my question would be, is there, would there, is there a, um, there's no, is there a cost or a downside if one were to take a more aggressive time schedule in terms of getting an ad, ad on the street now? For the, to, is there, a, I mean, is there a downside to that? If we got candidates and then they were, they weren't acceptable, we'd still be right where we are, where you're talking about. I mean, I, I guess Mike, it sounds like you're saying we're able to hire a, a replacement in time, and so what would be, what would we be doing in the interim time? I think, I think that. If you were to find a successful candidate in the, in this sh in the sh in the compressed time frame, it would be a home run. You would say like, "Wow, we did a good job. We we went with maybe the the um, the qualifications that we looked for the last time. Have they changed? Probably not so much. And and we've we've had a a good model for those. So could we go out and look for the same thing? Is there a clone? Yes, we, I mean, you know, and could we find that? That would be amazing if we found somebody in time. The downside for if we didn't find someone is the perception of would-be future candidates who say, oh, wow, wasn't that job posted a year ago? What happened to them? What have they been doing since then? Do I really want to, you know, do I want to be there now? I, I, I worry about our reputation in the marketplace if we try to rush things right now and it misfires. That's and but there's no way of knowing that right now. You don't know whether it's going to take or if it's going to fall apart. So I, I, I can't predict that. So I just am cautious about it. Mr. Meyer. Um, I think that given how recently 
the process went, went forward, I would be supportive of moving forward with the profile and the job description. I think as a school committee, we can take responsibility for that. If, if we as a school committee decide that we don't feel that that profile and the job description are accurate, then we could open up the process. But I feel that it's been posted so recently. I think the other thing is that the median tenure of a superintendent is so short in this state that to think that we're going to find someone who's going to be here for five years is a bit of a stretch. And so I think that it's more important to get the person who's going to lead the district here. And I think, again, the responsibility will come to us ultimately to decide whether or not the finalists are capable. And you know, we had a situation where we had a failed first round, and it didn't seem to hurt us in the market because we identified an excellent superintendent. So if, if that's the result of having to go through multiple rounds of searching, I, I, don't, I don't see the downside. Mr. Bourne? I was going to say, um, I think we should first look to see if there's a, an internal candidate who could serve as an interim, somebody who's really invested in the community, because I think that's been a problem for us is um, you know, finding somebody who might be willing to stick around. Um, and if we can't, I think we need to, we need to pay more. I mean, even with the budget constraints we're under, I think we need to pay more to attract and retain somebody. So. I'm, could, I'm sorry that combined two things, I think, in my, I didn't hear you clearly. You said look for an internal candidate. Interim, yeah. yeah as an interim. 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 Internal. To serve as an interim. And, and, and what is your rationale for, for specifying internal? I'm just saying, if there's somebody who could do the job, who lives in our community, I think it would, who's invested in the community, it's just something we should see if we can find before and, but we. Then, but then, what was the second portion of what you I'm said? Saying if that's not something we're, we're if, if there's not somebody who's willing, who can can fulfill that role, then I think we need to look at paying this, the next superintendent more money. I don't. If we advertise that it, doesn't, I don't understand. It. Yeah, I don't understand the correlation, though. I'm not sure why. This is kind of step one and step two, as I see it. I'm sorry if you don't. But the internal would, uh, but, but an interim, you would would be t would be taking over in August of. Right. So, and again, I, I'm not, I'm not, i was these. You, we can have two parallel tracks at here. Um, so, uh, so you're saying, look for it look for an interim at, at some point is one is one suggestion you're making well I'm just saying if we can find an internal candidate within the district who could serve as an interim that would be a good thing but would you do that in lieu of the of search as mr. Meyer described of, of I don't know. I just want, I'm not sure I just want to raise it as a, as a possibility okay other oh miss pick so you asked the downside for going forward with a, a permanent search now and so I, I'm not hundred percent convinced of where I stand but I, I, I think I'm in favor of an interim and one of the things that I think we should think about is do we want to hire a permanent superintendent before before or after we've defined our new administrative team in other words do we want to be hiring a new superintendent and new new principals um, all at the same time um, with no sense of how that's all going to um, integrate, or do we want to, you know, kind of get our principals in place, have an interim who perhaps knows our our um, district already and can kind of hold things safely and steady, steadily for us while we bring a new administrative team together, or, um, and then bring in a superintendent who's going to be able to fit well with that administrative team. I don't know which is better to do first, but I think that might be one way of looking at it. But so, so but who would, are you proposing that the, in, the interim would help fill the, the well, principal no, I, positions? I, I think the administrative team and the school committee is going to have to put out a, a you know, we're going to have to put out a search process, but right now we're, we're going to be doing three principal search pro processes. So I, I think that given all that, all the change that we are about to go through, mm -hmm. I think I'm concerned about what feels like a rush on a superintendent search, and I, I, that makes me very nervous um, to, to rush something that I'm, you know, for, that I, I, you know, is the the top position. That um, I don't think that we can count on being able to find, necessarily find somebody quickly, and get through the process quickly. Um, I don't know how we're going to begin to afford that process, and. Um, I, I'm just, I, I need to be reassured that that's something that, that makes most sense to do, given that we're also about to hire three new 
principles. Um, I somewhat agree with uh, Mr. Bourne <coughs> as far as looking for an internal interim. Um, somebody internal would already be invested in our community and that's basically it. They would be invested in our community if we could find somebody internal. Create another vacancy, of course. But, uh, <laughs> exactly my point. <laughs> Which they might not have heard, but I, I'm, I am uh, as concerned as anything about uh, stability of the district and with a difficult, facing a difficult budget with um, some reductions in staff I would like to see the I, I would like to see our remaining principals and administrators be able to comfortably do their jobs without causing the upset of taking one of them out and leaving a vacancy there that's going to be filled temporarily by someone else who wasn't <coughs> ready for that maybe wasn't prepared when I say ready I mean wasn't expecting to be given that kind of a responsibility in a difficult budget season and then have the whole thing go back to the way it was in six months, nine months, a year, whenever we do hire a permanent superintendent. So pulling an interim from within our district, particularly if it were principal or current administrator, is very concerning to me. I think it's going to be very important that our current principals have the opportunity to work with the principals that are going to be filling the vacant spots and pull together as a team. So I actually am very much more, in Stephanie said she wasn't sure about what she was saying. I'm very sure that that appeals more to me, that we would give the administrative leadership team time to come together as a cohesive unit and then look for a superintendent that can take a body that already exists and works well <coughs> together and then lead them forward so from there. An interim who's not internal? I'm saying that I would rather see an interim, I think, than a rushed search for, for that reason. And I'm saying that if there were an internal candidate that did not create um, what I would feel like might be a deficit or a um, in, in our current system or a, or a uh, hole where there's a, you know, a, a, a shift in the balance of power is what I'm trying to get at. I don't want someone who's currently one of the principals put into the position of interim superintendent and then put back into a position of principals. I don't think that that works well for creating a team that, that can function together really well. And I hope you understand that it has nothing whatsoever to do with questions about the qualifications or the ability of any of our alt team people or any of our administrators to do the job. I think that they could be qualified to do the job. It's really that I hate to upset the apple cart. Mr. Meyer. Um, my argument for moving ahead with dispatch is that we will be hiring or hoping to hire three principals who will serve at the pleasure of one individual, largely, the superintendent. And so what you're asking is a senior administrator to come in and roll the dice because they don't know who's going to be in that position of superintendent. And I think that we're going to work to try to get candidates and fill those positions, but if we could move forward and fill, and I checked the dates just now, March 14th is when we restarted the search that brought us Superintendent Salser. By the 24th of June, he was being offered the job. If we could move with that speed and have someone, have pros even prospects, even finalists in place in the beginning of June, then in terms of recruiting principals for half of the schools in our city, they would be able to think seriously about, are these four people that I could see myself working with as part of an administrative leadership team? I, re I really can't see how that would not affect our search for these three principals who are vital leaders in our city's educational system. I really can't see how we get around that detrimental effect. Um, okay, Mr. Schultz, I, I agree with what, what Mr. Meyer's saying. I think you used the phrase, upsetting out <laughs> I think we got to start putting some, finding someone who's going to put it right. And I, I do think that is a concern that if, if we have 
Uh, we don't have that person in place, and so we're hiring principals. I, I get concerned about the friction that could develop there. Okay. Um, all I know about Admiral Farragut is his famous quote. You all know his famous quote? We're going to hear it. <laughs> Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Um, we know that we want, need to hire a superintendent. We want to hire a permanent full-time superintendent. We cannot control how long that process will take. The only piece of that process we control is when we're going to start it. It seems like if we know that's what we want to get, and we want to get it, the sooner we get it, the better. So I think we should start the process as soon as we can so that we get to where we want to be as soon as we can, knowing that we don't know when that is. And that, that no, is not to say that we'll have a rushed process. We don't know how long the process will take. The process will go until we have hired a superintendent. Um, being aware that we may, and, and we, will, we will have some idea as we progress whether we'll need, need to have somebody filling that role as an interim basis or not, again, based on how the search goes, how the process goes. But I, I think we should, um, rather than sort of postponing that process for a year or something, I think it's far better. We know we need to have a permanent superintendent. Again, granted, permanent in America is not permanent. Okay. And um, that, um, so we should, I think we should start right now with the process. I think that um, the other thing that's been mentioned was having, essentially having the city manage our search process rather than hiring an outside consultant? Is that what you sort of said? That uh, what I was saying is that the administrative portion of it, the, okay. that, that all of that part of it, you know, could be the HR could manage, but I do think you would want to put together, I think we'd want to put together a search committee mm -hmm. that, that the all team could consult with and there'd be members of it on that committee and parents and other people that would be and, and in the interim time that you're developed, that the RFP or the position is out there, the conversations could happen that you're envisioning of the alt team trying to inform and about the kind of leader they're looking for, et cetera. That, that could all be happening while the posting is out. Um, so I, that, that's yeah, and I'm just thinking that a great deal of what the, soup, the, the consultant did for us last time, I think we don't need done again so much because it just was a couple of years ago. and. We could either reproduce it ourselves in terms of the idea of focus groups and sort of defining what we wanted to be looking for in a candidate. Um, I think the part that the consultant did that I don't know if we're capable of was sort of the, the screening of the applications um, and the vetting of those applications, although we did have one problem even so. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so. So, but I, but I think that I think this is something we could essentially something we could do, and the, the, the sooner we start on it, the better, because we don't know how long it's going to take, and if and if and to, to put it off, well, we still won't know how long it's going to take whenever we do start it, and I, I just think that we should take charge of it and start it. And I would just say HR screens every other position, you know, does that screening process for every other position virtually in the city, so it's not like it's something mm -hmm. that, that's. Mr. Board, and then the um, one concern I have is kind of um, what we're looking at in terms of the pool of possible candidates on kind of the timeline when superintendents across the state are out looking for jobs. And Brian, I don't know. I mean, you've been through it. Where do you think we are? I mean, if we were to start a search where we are now, are we going to still get a pretty good? Um, I mean, I know you were you were still available then, but is that was was that just a lucky chance, or is there still going to be a pretty good group of candidates out there looking for jobs and hearing about Northampton? Are they kind of already? in the mix of whatever, wherever they're going for? Well, what I think is that um, what you're mostly in the market for is somebody who has an assistant superintendent who has some good experiences looking for their first superintendency. And this time of the year is the right time for that type of candidate. The experienced candidates uh, usually are between October and January filling those positions. And as those positions get filled, that's when the next level of administrators start to think I think I'll look for something. And so this is good timing for a permanent person uh, if that's the type of candidate you want. And we're looking at assistant superintendent just because of what we can afford to pay? Is that kind of the? That's what I think, yeah. yeah. Mrs. Minnick. Um, I, I, have a, I have some concerns about what, what Downey's proposed for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, if, if the search went swimmingly and we found the exact perfect person, 
that's, that person still wouldn't be starting until the beginning of August <coughs> and then advertising and interviewing candidates for principals for three schools. That seems to me a little late to be populating schools. I didn't, didn't say that. Oh. So I said what that did the you say? I said that the process can go forward, but that there may be, you know, we're not going to hire principals in a day. No. There's going to be a period going forward. I'm hoping that before we have that final slate, and you know, maybe we'll get one right away, but maybe there will be two or three that we don't find right away. Again, we had a failed principal search recently. Right. So I'm saying that we won't even have the prospect of having a superintendent in place if we don't start the process right now. And, and I, you know, and I, I've said that I wasn't in favor of that, but I could understand starting the superintendent search right now. But I'm concerned about holding off on populating oh, I, principals I didn't until say that. after the superintendent comes. But if that's not what I, your point no, that's is, not what then, I was saying. then I'm not sure how we could ever expect to be hi having hiring principals that know which superintendent they're working for, unless the superintendent's already in place. That. So I, I guess I'm I'm missing. I, I'm I was missing saying, something. No, I was saying that the the superintendent will proceed with organizing searches for principals. However, if if those searches are if those decisions are being made, they will have some information about where our search is if it's ongoing. If we're advertising, if we have finalists advertised sometime in May, and again. The, the, I really, I really think it's difficult for me to conceive of three people coming in to a district. I mean, that's a massive turnover. That's a major career risk. Mm -hmm. Coming in with the super, a new superintendent, and again, as superintendents just said, most likely a superintendent with no experience as a superintendent. So again, I think that may delay our principal search. It's one thing as a, to jump in with both feet as a, you know, as a principal to an established district with a superintendent who's stable and a stable administrative le leadership team. It's another thing when half of the administrative leadership you know, is turning over for building leaders and you have a new principal. So I'm saying that let's get going, let's continue with what the superintendent's already started with the principal search, and if we get to a point where we have candidates identified, it will be to our benefit. If we don't, we won't be worse off. Because okay, if that, part, that much I agree with. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ms. Pick and then Mr. Bourne. Um, so I, I'm sorry to say it quite this way, but I'm feeling at a significant disadvantage for not knowing where our current administrators are feeling in, in this process. I feel like we've been talking for a long time about wanting to be collaborative in our decision-making process, and I'm, <coughs> I'm not an educator. I cannot put myself in their shoes. We're not inside an alt meeting. I just I think it's it's disrespectful of us to be making a decision about how best to proceed for their supervisor without including them in this discussion. I, I really don't feel like I can make a decision tonight about whether I want to go with an interim or, or a permanent search right now without deliberating with them. That's where I am. Um, that's fine, although I would just remind you that this, the, super, the school committee is responsible for hiring the superintendent, not the I, subordinates I to the that, superintendent. But I also don't that feel would just be the we don't make decisions in a vacuum. We've had, we, have, we canvassed administrators and staff and, and um, community members and parents and students before, and I feel like all of a sudden we're talking about making this decision on our own about how to proceed, and I'm not comfortable with that. Okay. I just was going to add in terms of, I mean, if we decided to go with an interim, having a, having a, um, we could find the right internal candidate, it would also be the advantage that they'd all, all already know the district really well. They wouldn't be spending a month or two finding out where Jackson Street is and who all the staff is. And I mean, they could get up to speed really quickly, which might be a benefit. So that's all. Okay. So uh, we're sort of getting to the end of our allotted time for this. I don't know. So I would just, I would just add, know my thoughts and uh, last time we met I was in favor of moving uh, forward as and I say quickly as possible and I don't mean rushed what I mean is that we finally felt what it feels like to have the momentum of having a superintendent in place and how wonderful we could move forward as a district and if we were fortunate enough to find someone soon I think um, it would not be 100% wise of us to put an interim in and miss an opportunity to start moving forward again. So I really don't feel 
that there is much harm in um, putting it out there, as Mr. Meyer has suggested, seeing if we can find a candidate. I think giving our current superintendent as a as a um, as a as a as a model of what we might be able to find after uh, looking once and not finding someone is a good model to to reinforce the idea that it doesn't hurt to um, to put it out there and see what we can find, even if it's later into the into the year. Uh, and so I would be in favor of moving forward. Uh, I have 100% confidence in each and every person that I sit on this committee with. If we had a pool of candidates in front of us that we weren't confident with, that we wouldn't rush a decision and put someone in there simply because we want a superintendent to start in September or August. We're smarter than that. We're better than that. We've proved that before in, in the example of going out a second time after we had finalists and brought them in. And I'm confident that we would do that again. So. I would be certainly in favor of um, doing just that, seeing if we can draw some candidates in, look at the pool of candidates in front of us. If we can't come to an agreement that we're comfortable with any of those as finalists, then we continue with the procedure that we, we've come to know, unfortunately, all too well, which is to, to keep searching until we find that right fit for us. Um, So I guess the question is, how do we? What's the what's the process moving forward in terms of? I don't know. Do you have a set model for a committee structure that you've always used in the past? If there's a search committee, is there a set structure that you've had in, in place? Uh, it was we we advertised for volunteers and it exactly. was a, um, that we as a committee decided on the makeup of that, how many okay. people we wanted, and what what kind of composition, and it, it took some time. So, so then, I think that you need to make a distinction now when you say search committee, because what we've had in the past is a screening. Committee. That's what I meant. I meant a screening yeah, committee. Yeah, because a screening we've committee. Had that somebody that would. Yeah. I think that we know what we want. I think we need to, as a full body, decide, you know, how we want to advertise the position and everything. The screening committee simply reviews those applications. That's what I meant. And yeah. recommends some number of finalists to the. That's so. That, that's what I meant. But there are some. There are school committees that have a search committee that's actually some subset of the entire body that mm -hmm. facilitates things or that is the liaison to a consultant if you had one. And I don't know if, I, I, I understand your offer from <coughs> having the city do um, some of the, some of the nitty gritty stuff, but I'd be curious to know if there is um, a consultant who would consider for a reduced fee just doing the vetting part. If we provide them with a list of qualifications, they're not doing focus groups, they're not mm -hmm. managing a whole search. They're just doing accepting applications, checking references, and vetting, you know, candidates. I, I just, I'd just like to see if somebody would be willing to do it for a reduced rate. If we can't find somebody, if they want to charge their full search fee, then it's probably not worth it to us. I, I mean, I that's, that's something we can. Calls, maybe. So, the question would be how we would pay for it, but that's a another issue. Um, right. The, the only the only function, if if we're not going to convene new focus groups, the initial that initial screen yes. of going through a stack of 50, 75 resumes and saying these are the ones to pass on to the screening committee, that's the function that we need to replicate. And I think that the value is that we had people who had worked as superintendents looking at that stack of applications. And I think that that's something that HR could not necessarily replicate for us. And that's where we would either need to go to NASDAQ and see if they would bid at a reduced rate, providing limited services, or maybe um, Mass Association of School Committees also you know, provide services like that so that they would, I thought the screening committee worked very well last time. Um, and I thought the composition <laughs> As, and the, the broad spectrum of people in the community was also very effective. So I think that's fine. We just need to get the screening piece done at the very beginning. I don't really know. This might be something they hadn't thought of in their job description. But do you recall the uh, people from DESE who were here a month ago who said they were made up retired principals and school administrators and they would offer us their support and things? This would be really very supportive of us. and. Um, might be might be a worthwhile service in terms of doing that initial 
sort of screening about this is a serious candidate versus not. Okay, so we can certainly investigate that, and then so so it sounds like for the next uh, for the next meeting of the school committee, we should we could bring forward that structure you were asking about and put a call. I mean, I've already had people calling my office saying I would like to serve on a screening committee. We've already had people sending resumes. Yeah. We've already had so there's already an interest out there in it, and so I think we could safely say that we're yeah. going to ask people to submit for that and that but we'll actually approve a structure of what that would be at our next meeting we would bring forward a proposed structure and the committee could approve that this is in fact the structure which we would then work to populate mm -hmm. um, but the other question if I could just finish would be for now is there any agree is there is there agreement or a motion that we would want to set a time for when we actually want to re-advertise the position or get that process underway. Ms. Minnick. I guess I was just going to remind the committee of Stephanie's concern voiced twice already that she would like to hear from the administrative leadership team and I'm looking at this, I'm envisioning a schedule in my mind and trying to see if there's a time before our April meeting or shortly thereafter. I, I, we are about to be making decisions here. I mean, you're asking for a motion right now that might even be one of those decisions. And I, I realize she's only one member of the committee, but I do, I do understand her concern. And I feel that the administrator's perspective on, on, you know, adding adding additional members to the administrative leadership team and or looking for a superintendent, I I would value their input as well. So I just don't know how we get that. So I think that I, we re, so I think in order to get past that, we would have to have a, a motion on how we want to proceed. I would like to make a motion. I'd like to move that we um, move ahead with it, with the search um, as soon as possible and I'd not delay it any further because we are under time constraints. Uh, but you have to, def uh, so could you be more definitive about uh, what you're asking? Search. Yeah. Uh, that do you mean advertising? Yeah. Advertising, the whole yeah. nine yards going yeah. right out so, to the whole so for, the, for the purpose of a permanent superintendent, yes. Okay. So that's a motion. That is a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second. Okay, now we could discuss that. and um, So the, the idea would be to actually <coughs> add, move forward and, and advertise. Yes. And then put in place the other And pieces. be optimistic and hope that everything just believe that everything's going to fall into place like it did and if it didn't then just like last time it gets opened up and it starts again and then we decide to go from there but I do agree with Ms. Pick as far as um, wanting the alt team's input however I'm fearful that the longer that we take the, the less options that we're going to have as far as what's realistic okay. Other yeah, I mean the, none of the members of the I mean, as nice as it would be to be able to sit down as a group, none of them are members of this body. None of them are constrained by open meetings. All of them are free to have conversations with each and every one of us. And we are free to contact them and, and solicit their opinions on how they think this should go forward. And then when we convene at our next meeting, if we wish to modify the search based on those considerations, we can. But I think that, again, if, if we're searching around for times that maybe all of us can meet, maybe all of us can't. I, I think that we risk we risk delaying this unnecessarily. Um, is this body prepared to delegate to some uh, select few of uh, uh, members the wording of the ad, the uh, you know the decisions about where the ad is placed and how long it runs and so forth? I, I'm talking about the particulars of, of that. So I believe that's essentially what happened last time. Um, I think it was Alden and a couple of other people yeah, who, yeah. who drafted the brochures and the whatnots and then submitted them to the consultant who then sent them out. But um, so yeah, I think that that was a, an analogous process. I would think would make sense if we draft it and then we have to identify where we send it to. I think that's clearly a key part of the whole recruiting process, is making sure we send it to the audience we want to have receive it. Um. I mean, certainly that those pieces of where it goes can certainly be, again, I would, I keep going back to HR, but that's what they do, and there are, there are 
online listservs or other even the some of the associations that have been mentioned tonight now have online job postings that you can post these things to. So there, we can certainly work on the wording of an ad if you do want to have a, if we want to appoint a couple of members who want to work, be willing to work on that to approve that, we can certainly do that. Um, I don't think the language of an ad would need to be approved by the entire school committee, uh, but, but whatever, if, you, if we want to delegate that, we can certainly do that. You had a follow up. Yes, um, which is that the last time we were doing a search, the consultant was the one that was placing the ads, making sure they ran the right times, all of those things. Yep. And again, I think it would behoove us to find out if there's a consultant that can handle putting some of that stuff out there. The other advantage of having a consultant is, that, and I realize, I, <laughs> I'm sensing body language that says we can't afford a consultant. Well, I, 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 have, I, 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 I have an HR department who yes. that's their job is to put ads in the paper and to advertise and if positions. that's if it were just putting ads in the paper but my point is about to be that uh, m the other thing that a consultant does for you is recruiting and I don't think our HR department can do recruiting and so to the extent that we don't have someone just respond to the ad that's the perfect candidate a consulting firm would actually make con a contact uh, a network of people and get names of other people so it is a recruiting process in addition to just advertising for an open position so I I have a little caution that we may lose some number of candidates in our pool just because they aren't actively trolling the you know education week website to see if there are big positions but that somebody that might be perfect for us. Well, also, so. the other thing is that NESTEC might know about a couple of candidates who just didn't get the job they wanted, but are great candidates, right? So, so I mean, uh, there, uh, there's, I'd, I'd like to be able to make the call and find out what it would cost to have NESDEC help us <coughs> or, or MASC help us. Okay, well, our current motion just says we'll start this process soon. It doesn't say exactly what the process is, right? Um, he was looking for specificity, I think, on that, right. so. <laughs> the current motion, I think, was just to go ahead and start putting in to, right to, to go ahead. And go. Yeah. I, I think that we're not remembering accurately how much our consultant did for us last time in terms of, I mean, the, the, the writing up of the job description and, and all in the form groups and all that, that was the preliminary part. But then there was a huge um, portion that happened before we actually met where, yes, that person went out and did a lot of recruiting for us and throughout the organization they recruited um, twice over um, by exactly what you said. It's like people who might have not gotten the job they wanted but, you know, are looking again because they don't want to go through that but might be called or... Um, they were they actually called people not just from New England but from all over the country because of the, they knew of those people we, we certainly won't have access to any of that um, they also trained the screening committee and um, th there it was having been on both rounds of it it was really valuable training that they did for us um, unless you're a, a professional um, interviewer of superintendents there, there's some finesse that's involved and uh, we were really helped with that. They certainly went through all of the information in a way that I don't know that our HR department can do because they are educational experts and they know what they're looking for and I think it's different than what our HR department does. And I, I just think there are so many pieces, I'm sure I'm, I'm not enumerating them at all. I, I, um, you know, I, didn't, I didn't bring my NASDAQ book with all of the, the list of things that they did for us. Um, in the ways that they were helpful. And as the chair of the committee, I was in a lot of contact with, um, with Joe, who was our consultant. Um, he did an enormous amount of work for us, and I don't know who's going to be doing that. I, I, it's not just about HR. There's, there's more, more to it than that. I really, I, I understand that people want to get going on this, and it's not that I'm opposed to getting going. I'm opposed to getting going in the way that we are. Um, I think it's more complicated than we're hoping it's going to be. What I say is, someone who's new to the committee, I wasn't here last time when I heard Brian. What's making me uneasy is, I, I'm, I'm, consultants will tell you that they can do wonderful things. 
I don't know what the dollar figure is worth attaching to it, and that makes me uneasy. I think we would want. They were twenty five grand last time, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Right. But it sounds like we're saying, you know, well, twenty five thousand dollars. That's a that's a that's a significant chunk of change. We're talking about trying to work with them to to, to whittle them down a little bit, um, which I think is a, is a good thing. But I guess I'm just saying, I I, I feel the need for numbers to, to see where we're going to end up before we can say, well, yeah, we should do a consult or yeah, we, or no, we should. Just wanted to say that. And again, I guess I fall back to the my my starting point, which is it does not cost us anything to put the ad out there and see what candidates it attracts. Not sure the cost to put ads out. Well, it certainly costs to put the ad out, but it doesn't cost forty thousand dollars to put the ads out. We don't have to hire a consultant to put the ad out. Um, but th that's just my concern. Um, well, I, I have a, a concern that tied to that. Do I think one of the that potentially could cost us is. Again, sort of making sure that the, the right groups of people receive the ad. Um, I think we'll probably hear during public comment from some members of the Civil Rights Committee to make sure that our search actively contacts groups of people who are not just like us. And um, that's a really good thing, and that's what we want to do. And I don't know, again, in other words, if our HR department would be open to suggestions of other places to post this ad other than their usual it's good that he's municipal <laughs> sort of job listings. Um, so that would be a concern of mine, that it, that it would be actually, again, maybe more creative than it probably already is in terms of where the information is sent. Okay. So I, w we have a motion on the table. I'm not quite sure what the status of that is at this point. It's. Uh, there was a motion made to move forward with a, uh, by opening a search process, uh, but it sounds like there's still details that people want to understand about that. I'd like to make one more comment. Um, if we go ahead and start a search process and we find that we're in over our heads and we can't do it in time or we ha can't do it well, I think that we may lose a chance for um, how we're going to find a good interim because by that point it's probably June. So that's a, that's a concern also. I, I just don't think that, I don't think that we have the time that we want because even though we, we might have, we started the second round in March, we were well into the process. We had already done an enormous amount of the work. And I just, I, I, don't, I don't think that we have the but time. But it seems like an awful a lot of the work has already been done since it was only done two years ago. But the work that, I don't mean that part, I don't mean, in, it's in not the focus group part. It's right, I understand. The, the focus part. group and the ads, we already know what the ads are, so uh, the mayor is, is suggesting going with HR, which we have available to us. I, get um, I do it's understand that, that they're not going to be recruiting. The HR isn't actively going to be recruiting, but it's a good place to start something that we have. Is We don't have the money. We don't have the money. I mean, if we can find them to go into and say, okay, this is what you did last time, but we don't need all of this because we already know it. Forgive me, but, uh, and this is not to cast aspersions on the HR department either, but we are talking about hiring the educational leader for our city and our district. I think, I think that some people might be penny wise and pound foolish here. If, if, we, if it costs us $10,000 or $15,000 to find the exact perfect candidate for this position, it's worth it. If we have to hire an interim and wait six to nine months or a year, to find the perfect candidate, I, I again think it's worth it. I don't want to lose momentum, as Mr. Sahowski has said. I don't want to miss opportunities and wait if we don't have to, but I am concerned that we will be rushing the process and that we won't do a good job of it if we try to just do it. I think we will do a good right job. Now. Um, and, and I really, I really am not. I am concerned about missing the the best candidates by doing it in a slapdash way. I'm sorry, that's my opinion. I realize I'm only one of two. And I would only say that we, you know, I guess in defense of my HR department, we managed to hire a police chief, a fire chief, and all of our other high-level executives in the city um, using that process. So I just I have to defend them. So. Um, and if it didn't work, then we could go the other. I mean. That's the thing. It's not like we're putting the money first and then saying, well, if the paying for it doesn't work, then we'll try the HR. We're trying the, mm -hmm. the, the freeway first and then go the other way. And we, I don't believe any of us are going to rush into a decision just based on time. I'm just thinking that 
maybe we have good luck. We had good luck last time, maybe the second time around, but it was the timing and everything, and it was good luck. Mr. Bourne. Can I just mention, mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if West Springfield is instructive at all, but what happened at West Springfield is that they found an internal candidate, made them an interim, and they did such a great job that that's now the permanent superintendent, and they love him. So I'm just saying, before we begin this whole process of ads and searches and all that, I'm just saying, is there, it's just worth a look. If there's somebody in the district who could be an interim who might lead to something bigger, it might solve some of our problems, a lot of our problems. So just want to make sure we've looked at that. That's all. Okay. So the motion that's on the table was a motion to move forward with advertising and a search process. Second, we had discussion. Um, are folks ready to vote on that? I'm still not clear what we're voting on in okay. terms of what, what, is, what is that process? Is it who is doing that? I mean, what is the actual nuts and bolts of that? Cause, and like the ad process with what? And, okay. you know, I'm just not clear. In terms of how that would happen? Yeah, exactly. So what am I voting for? What's, what is this process that we're starting? I could appoint, uh, I could seek volunteers and appoint several, a uh, couple of members of this body to work with HR to facilitate the administrative aspects of of the job description, the posting, et cetera, to get that process started. Uh, and obviously, but then coming back to the school committee at the next meeting with a uh, outline of what that search screening committee would look like to be appointed. Mm -hmm. And where would the question the consultant fit in that plan? I could certainly invest, we could certainly do an investigation of that and try to bring information <laughs> back to uh, the school committee at the next meeting about what the possibilities are for that. So just, just sorry, just so that I'm clear, it sounds like what you're saying is we're we're voting right now on whether or not to kind of take baby steps towards putting an ad out there <laughs> for a super. In other words, you're saying you're going to talk to your HR department, we're going to think about appointing a committee, we're going to um, no, I would appoint investigate a consultant. Tomorrow. I would appoint members tomorrow and get okay. working on this, okay. most certainly. Yeah, it would not be baby steps. We would, uh, you know, be prepared to put an ad out, in, you know, early in the, in the new month. Before the next meeting? Uh, yes. Okay. And again, the ad would go out and there'd be time for all these other discussions. If that's what people want to do, that would be the question. <coughs> okay. Thank you. That clarifies it for me. You'd be prepared to name a, uh, to, to look for a committee, to, which committee tomorrow? <laughs> no. Uh, Miss Miss uh, Pick had said that before we had dele oh, I'm sorry Miss Minnick had said that we had uh, delegated to a few members the task of reviewing the ads and things like that. I said I could, I would be I could certainly appoint those people uh, to do that, or I would accept volunteers who were interested in doing that. I that was I, that's I just what wanted I wanted clarification. Yeah. Um, I just to address your point, I, I was thinking about it. Um, Anybody could apply for this, whether it's advertised as interim or permanent. It seems to me that um, the, the person who would apply for the interim position could apply for the permanent, mm -hmm. and permanent. whereas there would be a number of people who might not apply for an interim position mm -hmm. who would apply for a permanent position. So you know, it yeah, seems to me you yeah. can get a larger group of people, people. internal and external, both, um, if it's the permanent position. Mm -hmm. And as we noted, because the turnover in superintendents is fairly high, they're all kind of interim. <laughs> I agree with Mr. Moore. I would encourage um, people from within also uh -huh. to apply for the position. Yeah. I think that would be a great idea. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, so are you ready to vote on the motion? And is there an understanding of what the motion entails? Yeah. Could we just hear it one more time? I don't know if Annie read the motion. Do you want to read the motion back? I know it seems to have morphed several times. <laughs> Mr. Ball can you tell us your reason. Search as soon as possible for the purpose of permanent superintendent. That was the original motion. And then there was a question about what you meant by that in terms of does that mean, what does that mean? And the question was about moving forward right. advertising in the search committee. But I don't know if. if yes, that, that was what it was meant to be included. I just considered that part of the hitting the 
the floor running kind of thing, you know, moving. Yeah, but Annie would like the language exactly. to type into the I know. so she didn't have to make it up that. herself. Yeah. 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 It, it would make a difference to me to know exactly what you meant, because to move ahead immediately with search, I All right, for begin that. tomorrow to, to get the screening. Tomorrow, I'm voting against it. No, so. to get the screening, to, to, to yes. do as the mayor just suggested, get a committee started, get start getting volunteers, start looking into whether or not human resources is the place to do it, put the advertising, I mean, at least start to get the advertising, get all of our stuff together from the previous search and figure it out and look whether the consultant, the whole process to see. But not put an ad in the paper. We aren't ready to put an ad in the paper. Good. Okay, thank you. That's what I needed. Because we have to do she everything else first. Yeah. Oh, no. No, it means let's, let's get going and, okay. and not keep let's discussing get going. it. Not hit the right. 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 So, so, to authorize the mayor to put together the process of, of fulfilling the um, filling position for a permanent superintendent. So, so we are not advertising before we meet again. Is that what we're saying? I am considering it, but I, I, I would think not. I would think that we would have to go through and figure out everything else first. I'll get the questions that's answered not first. What I, that's not what I was hearing. I, I was hearing that we can go ahead and start putting in an ad and start getting the committee together. I mean, it, whatever it is has to be a process. We have to get That's what you're screen. saying now, but that's right. not what I was hearing. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I apologize that, for she's that. She's describing what her motion is, and if that's the motion, if that's the motion and that's the will, that, then that's what we'll do. Um, I mean, our next meeting will be April 11th, right. and it will be focused on taking a vote on the city on the school budget, so it may entail my calling a special meeting <laughs> before then. Yeah. Uh, to take this up, I mean that would my preference would be to start, get started on this sooner rather than later. Um, so it may entail. I mean, we, at our last meeting we said we should have a special meeting because we don't want to. We're already now spilling over beyond where we thought we'd be. So I think it would we'd have to call a special meeting. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I was thinking that we were going to delegate the placement of the ad and that we were going to, you were going to inquire perhaps with the assistance of the vice chair into a consulting contract to perform the limited duties that we envisioned and that that was what the committee was going to authorize. If that's not the case, then I, see, I would think we must have a special meeting. That this vote is to, this, this, vote would, this vote would allow you to begin moving forward with human resources to come up with a strategy as well as to consult with volunteers from the school committee about the precise language of the advertisement, but that if we are going to retain the authority here over actually placing that ad, then we need to meet next week. Well, you're welcome to amend the motion <laughs> if you want to well, amend it. I, I mean, it's, well, it seems like if we That's basically what I was trying to... Well, then I'll offer it as a friendly amendment that... Uh, except. <laughs> <laughs> but did Second. Annie get that? Yes. So, so the motion was to authorize the mayor and the vice chair to work with human resources to outline a process for advertising the position of superintendent. In addition, to authorize the mayor to select any number of members of the school committee as a subcommittee to come up with the wording of in any advertisement or materials prepared in connection with that advertisement. In addition, to recommend that the mayor call a special meeting next week to revisit this process and to report back to us on any information that he has discovered in connection with a limited consulting contract. Thank you. Good thing I'm not busy next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, and that's a... That's that's basically good so job. Second, Thank you. Second I second that, that uh, friendly that amendment. amendment. Okay. So now you've heard the motion. Before we forget it, I'll, I'll, <laughs> all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? No. No. Okay. Uh, so there are two no's and, and aye, so the motion carries. Okay. Uh, so we will now um, move on to the next item on the agenda, which would be the public comment uh, period. And uh, let me get the list from the clerk.
the cost for making is it worth announcing that we've gotten some money back before people stand up here? On um, I, or is that not allowed? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're going to be. Um, it's been in the paper. It's been in the newspaper. Okay. And, right. okay. Uh, right. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, we're now moving to the public comment period, and we have a list. Um, I'm going to uh, be keeping the time three minutes. I would ask you to please uh, state your name and address uh, for the record, and uh, again, try to adhere to the three-minute time limit out of fairness uh, to fellow speakers. The first person signed up is uh, Sawyer Driver Schroeder. My name is Sawyer Driver Schroeder. I live at 28 Columbus Avenue in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I'm here to talk about a little bit of the budget concern and about the arts department and the tech department. I truly believe that Northampton High School needs a tech department. And I believe I am living proof that we do need one. Uh, they were the reason, those classes in the tech department and the arts department were the reason why I was able to stay in school for four and a half years and actually graduate. The one teacher who actually helped me the most in my years at the high school was uh, Mr. Jacobson Hardy, the photography teacher and AV teacher. He taught me so much about photography and audiovisual throughout the years, um, so many different things. But the most important thing that he really taught me wasn't about photography or audiovisual. It was how to learn in a way that is respectable and creates a positive learning environment for everyone, not just myself. He was just an excellent role model for me and a very kind person in every aspect of his teaching. Um, he truly inspired me to be a better person. And I was very rambunctious, pretty disrespectful and rude when I was younger, even up until like sophomore and junior year. But he has always been supportive and of my learning and of me bettering myself. He would always give me gentle reminders to keep up the good work in all of my classes, not just his own, where most teachers were concerned in their specific subject. He even supported the wood shop class um, and brought in a lot of very expensive wood just to donate so that we could all experiment with different grain patterns just because he found it would be a good idea and he likes to help students. Overall, I believe having a teacher like that and having the tech department still around saved me 100%. I believe I would have dropped out my sophomore year of high school if I didn't have those classes to look forward to almost every semester. I just, I don't understand how we could ever think of cutting these departments because they affected me and so many other students in such a positive way. And I am mainly up here so I could ask you to please allow him to positively affect more of the future classes of Northampton High School as he and other teachers in the tech department have done for me and for my class. Without him, as I said before, I, Sawyer Driver Schroeder, would not have graduated from high school. I would be nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Nina Dudley. Nina Dudley. Hello. Um, <clears throat> my name's Nina Dudley. Um, I live at 52 Ward Avenue in East Hampton. Uh, I'm the parent of two former NHS students. My son Miles was, um, he was not a very academic kid. He, I think um, he would have felt like a failure in high school if it weren't for two things, soccer and Mr. Jacobson Hardy's audiovisual classes. He worked hard in these classes and he was able to express through digital media that he could, things that he could not express in words. The class in photography and video often serves students who do not excel in more academic subjects. It opens the door for these students to a way to be successful in the world. It gives them skills in the field of digital media, which they can continue to use and build on in college and in work. Tragically, uh, Miles died in 2007. 
one semester into his first year at Fitchburg State College in the film and video program. After he died, his father and I set up a scholarship at NHS for students who excel in photography and video. Each year, $500 is awarded to two students. And Mr. J.H. has told me that one of these scholarship recipients has gone on to work at WGBY. She wrote in her classroom journal one day, this course was the beginning of my life. I hope to keep filming as a career and you have helped me get started. I learned that great ideas could come if you believe in them and that's what I did. I believed in myself. I now know that things take time, process and determination to finish. I think that I now know that I can create professional things and so in the future I can look back on this class and pursue other cre <coughs> excuse me, creative means. This year alone, Mr. Jacobson Hardy taught three sections of audio video to 60 students and six sections of photography to 121 students for a total of 181 students. On average, roughly 20% of all NHS students take his classes each year. I have to ask you in today's world, would you rather have your child go to college and major in English Lit or in digital media? In a community like Northampton, so educated and with so many resources, it's a travesty that the high school is considering cutting the only photography, photography and video class they offer. I urge you to keep the AV program in this school and please give all children a chance to succeed. Thanks. The next speaker is Morgan Moffitt. Oh, um, and Fiona D'Ambrosia. Okay, hi, I'm Morgan Moffitt from 341 Ryan Road. And I'm Fiona D'Ambrosia from 668 North Farms Road. And we're here to talk to you also about Mr. Jacobson Hardy's photography class. And yeah, so the photography class at NHS is not only an option for everyone, but is an opportunity for people who don't necessarily have a place in chorus or band. Photography is a place for students to use their strengths to make art. For example, whose interest in bikes couldn't really make music from that or be part of a band with their bike. But if they were to place a position, their bike in a position, and then take a million dollar picture of it, and that's what photography shows you. It gives you a chance to be loud and get your voice a point and cross without even opening your mouth. It allows you, it allows others to see the world in different perspectives and that's what you see through a naked eye. Uh, okay. um, these electives provide students to be creative and you have to work hard to be successful. Teens that have the ability to create, to take creative risk, which can be stifled in academic classes. Art teaches to be individual and allows different perspectives. Their classes encourage teens to express themselves and tell their stories. Success comes from creativity and the hard work and not right and wrong answers and questions. In contrast, in academic classes, where you're looking in a tunnel, looking for the light, Art is like an open field with fresh air and freedom. For many high school students, the only success they feel in the high school is in the arts. If you take away the arts, you're taking away their access to success. <clears throat> Mr. Jacobson Hardy has been doing photography for 30 years. He has published three books and has had art hung up next to Picasso. He's been working at NHS for a solid seven years. When we asked him what photography meant to him, he said the world. Photography has sent me around the world. It surprised me what I could do. Mr. J not only wants us to learn how, to, how creative we are, he also wants us to know that we can do whatever we want to do. The last thing that Mr. J told us was that this is me and this is what I have to lose. But I want you to leave this class with confidence in the world that you can do anything because that's what I got out of it. Thank you, Bob. The next speaker is Ellen Hirschberg. Um, 
My name is Ellen Hirschberg. I live at 61 Washington Ave in uh, Northampton, and I also work at Northampton High School. I agree with all the previous statements, but I am here today to talk about the Superintendent Search Committee. So I am representing the Northampton High School and JFK Middle Civil Rights Committee. Here in Northampton, we have a diverse group of students, and we need a diverse group of teachers that reflects the student body. For many years, the Northampton Public System Civil Rights Committees have been concerned about the about the underrepresentation of teachers of color in the Northampton Public Schools. As the school committee embarks on the search for the new superintendent, please keep in mind that the way to make progress on racial and ethnic diversity among teachers is to have a commitment from the superintendent to this ideal. The Civil Rights Committee has discussed and drafted numerous proposals with many strategies to address increasing diversity, beginning with the hiring process. Some suggestions include the hiring committee itself needs to be racially diverse. An effort should be made to, fo to have focus groups that include teachers, staff, students, and families of color to talk with potential candidates about their views on diversity issues in the public school systems. Interview questions should include questions about candidates' commitment to hiring a, ra hiring a racially diverse teaching staff and all viable candidates need to articulate a wide, ra wide range of informed strategies about how to make this happen. We are aware that the school committee is dealing with many urgent issues at this time. We ask that the superintendent search process, in this superintendent search process, you do not lose sight of this important element in the hiring the right candidate to lead the Northampton school system. The Civil Rights Committee is available to consult and provide guidance during this hiring process with the goal of hiring administrators who are fully competent in addressing diversity within our school system. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Ruth Ever. Hi, uh, Ruth Ever. I live at 17 Chestnut Avenue in Leeds. Uh, I am the parent of two students in the school district. I'm also currently the co-chair of the high school PTO, although I'm not here representing the PTO officially. And um, I was concerned that the students and families who really benefit from the tech ed classes were not going to be represented here tonight, but they have been more than adequately represented and far more articulate than I, so I just support everything that's been said and I really don't need to add anything. Thank you. Next speaker is Suzanne Strauss. Suzanne Stra Strauss, 809 Ryan Road in Florence. Um, I just want to say, preface what I'm going to say with the fact that I think what's happening in the school system is sort of has gone beyond irony to absurdity. This is a community problem, and I think the community has to solve it, so I know that it's not, I'm not laying it at your feet. But I did have students in the writing class write editorials to the paper, and I wanted to read one from Sophie Flynn. It's called Paradise Lost. Let me pull up a quote I found on our website. Quote, welcome to Paradise City, Northampton, Massachusetts. Northampton offers a lifestyle rich in cultural, artistic, academic, and business resources. This is how we portray ourselves to the world. And here in Paradise City, we are seriously considering shrinking the arts and special education departments in our schools. I know it's not just Northampton. I know it's the entire school district. But this, this right here is a dose of hypocrisy that just drives me up the wall. The schools are short almost one and a half million dollars. The town as a whole needs over two million. Due to this, right now, there's a lot of talk of cutting down in Northampton schools. I'd like to take a moment to think about what that means and address them. Job loss, fewer creative outlets, larger classes. Let us look at this logically, one talking point at a time. One, according to 22 News, Northampton is planning to cut the jobs of 24 teachers. That's 24 teachers who would either lose their jobs or have both their hours and paychecks dramatically reduced. One has to worry about teachers like Stephen Eldridge in the theater department who is raising a teenage daughter of his own, or Bo Flahive in the chorus who already works part-time and who might not be able to afford to continue working at NHS if their paychecks are cut. 
It's not just the arts here either. They're also planning on cutting down on special education. You can't just look at it as a way to save money. You have to consider whether the cuts will make it more worth their while for our teachers to go to work somewhere else. These are people, not machines. Two, if we do go through with these, quote, eliminations, you have to consider the impact. Even if we don't lose any teachers besides the ones you fire, reducing the number of humanities makes them automatically less available. No matter how skilled the teacher, a class can only hold so many kids, and it's hard enough getting into a class you want as it is. Some people can afford to take extra courses outside of school, but plenty of us can't. For some of these kids, school is their only chance to be exposed to the arts, the only time in which they can focus on them. Besides helping us decide what path we want to take in life, the arts help us to develop as human beings. People who study the humanities have been proven to be more creative thinkers, better with language, get higher test scores, and even seem to be more empathetic than, the most, than most that don't. If you limit the chance we have to be exposed to art, if you limit our creative outlets, you shrink the boundaries of our minds and risk stunting our emotional growth. Three. If you lower the number of classes in any department, you raise the average number of students in all of the others. That means less one-on-one -on -one time between teachers and students, lower learning quality, more time spent on homework because there wasn't enough in class, and more work for everyone. Not to mention the negative impact on special needs students. I am a high-functioning autistic teen, and let me tell you, our school is not built for kids with sensory issues. The amount of noise in a class of 20 kids alone, not even considering the structure of the room, is still sometimes too much for me. We can't learn anything if we're not in class. And while I can't speak for students with different disabilities from mine, I know that if you raise the number of students to, in my class to say 30, I'm going to wind up walking out much more often. And more work won't help kids with anxiety issues. In fact, since you're also planning on cutting six special education teachers from our already limited special education department, this whole section of the discussion just gets worse the longer you think on it. Northampton's Mayor David Narkowitz was able to find $900,000 in the health care system, and I'm proud to say that half of that is going back into the schools. However, $1,400 minus $450,000 does not equal zero. We still need $950,000 and that's not going to be easy to raise, certainly not within the time constraints we have. I understand that the budget was cut for a reason, but if Mayor Narkowitz can find this much laying around in health care, I should think there's more to be found in the system somewhere. A note, our schools are our investment in our children, our future, and if all we're teaching them is that what they need to pass, is what they need is to pass the next standardized test, we're doing it wrong. The same goes if the environment is too much for otherwise good students to learn in. So please, Look deep into your hearts and deep into your budget and find a way to protect this vital piece of our town. Because if we can't, if we can't, we need to check that cocky attitude at the door because a town without art is no kind of paradise. Okay, the next uh, speaker is uh, Kyle O'Connell. Kyle? about six minutes. Hello, my name is Kyle O'Connell and I live at 175 North Elm Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. I am currently a ninth grade student at Northampton High School and as a musical artist and a member of the school band, I am strongly opposed to the proposed cuts for Northampton High School. Um, as a recent assignment in writing class, we were instructed to write editorials which will be sent to the Gazette, given to the school committee and the city council. Tonight I will be reading my editorial entitled, Art and Electives, Essential to Education. As many Northampton area residents know, the city of Northampton is facing a budget deficit of $2.4 million for the coming year. One of the city's plans to meet this is to lacerate the arts programs at Northampton High School. As a ninth grade student and active member of the band, I will feel the impact of these cuts in a negative way. The band is not the only program which will feel these cuts. It cuts all electives and arts to a minimum. During the recent rally for creativity in the arts, students voiced their concerns of the art being cut. Quote, art is my future. I want to be an artist, not a mathematician, Josh Dietz, a visual artist at Northampton High School, announced. Some may consider electives to be extra or unnecessary, while there are studies which show that arts are a critical part of education. According to the Americans for the Arts, quote, art strengthens problem solving and critical thinking skills, adding to overall academic achievement and school success. Currently, the plan is to eliminate up to 30 teaching positions district-wide. One recently retired North NHS teacher proclaimed, quote, people here care more about organic garlic than education. And personally, I agree. 
Eliminating any teachers could have a profound effect on the overall culture and morale of the high school. Mr. Melnick, voted Teacher of the Year by the student body last year, is a beloved technology and woodshop teacher and currently holds a position which will be cut if the cuts go through. Many students rely on his shop classes to re release their creativity and take a much needed mental break from more academic classes. The mayor has proposed a plan of switching the city health plan to skate group insurance commission, a plan which lowers the budget gap from $2.4 million to $1.5 million, a savings of $900,000. The schools alone have a deficit of $1.25 million. Therefore, the health plan switch is a start. However, it does not completely solve the problem. School committee members should push for a local aid formula reformation to allow for the funds to be more fairly distributed. The burdening of the city's budget constraints should not fall on the shoulders of children and young adults of the city schools. To many, art and electives are core parts of their education. Northampton has been called the best small arts town in America, and I ask, how can we claim this when the arts are being cut from our schools? Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. The next speaker is Zach Dietz. Hi, I'm Zach Dietz. I live on 222 Elm Street uh, in Northampton, Mass. Um, I, as a student at NHS, I'm a freshman. I totally, um, art cuts would affect me in a negative way, but personally, I don't take any electives. I haven't taken any electives. I plan on taking electives, but currently, I haven't taken an elective. So I can't really speak about how great the other teachers are uh, how great the art teachers are and how great the tech teachers are. But I've heard from my friends that it's totally awesome and I totally regret not taking an art class this year. So next year, I plan to do it if they still exist. Um, so more I, I came here to talk to you today um, was, about, uh, the, was about what you guys can do. Because I understand that all of you, if you're on the school committee, you like, the sc you like school. You, like, you want to improve it. You don't want to slash everything. You don't want to take away the arts. That's not what you guys are about. So in a district where we have three principals that are leaving and we have a superintendent that's leaving, we're going to have big change. And with this big change is opportunity to be creative. Um, we have drastic times right now, and that calls for drastic measures. There's a lot of things we could do. We could consider regionaliz regionalization, um, so like merging superintendents with another district. We could cut busing. We could close an elementary school. We could cut salaries of higher waged workers in the city. Um, we could negotiate with the teachers union uh, for some furlough days. All of these aren't good things to do. Um, they're all really controversial, and nobody, not everyone in the community is going to like them. Um, but we really got to think of Northampton as like a child that needs to take like a bitter pill that's <clears throat> hard to swallow. But that pill is gonna gonna save the child's life. So um, that's all I really had to say to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker is Claire Ann Williams. Claire Ann. My name is Claire Ann Williams, and I live at 21 Riverside Drive. And in the music department, we say, here we go again. <laughs> and I'm going to start tonight with an excerpt from a speech given by the Boston Conservatory music professor, Carl Polnick. It was sent to me by a band parent hoping to raise my spirits in these times. The first people to understand how music really works were the ancient Greeks. The Greeks said that music and astronomy were two sides of the same coin. Astronomy was seen as the study of relationships between observable, permanent, external objects. And music was seen as the study of relationships between invisible, internal, hidden objects. Music has a way of finding the big, invisible, moving pieces inside our hearts and souls and helps us to figure out the position of things inside us. Let me give you an example of how this works. One of the most profound musical compositions of all time is the Quartet for the End of Time, written by French composer Olivier Messiaen in 1940. Messiaen was 31 years old when France entered the war against Nazi Germany. 
He was captured by the Germans in June of 1940, sent across Germany in a cattle cart, imprisoned in a concentration camp. <clears throat> he was fortunate to find a sympathetic prison guard who gave him paper and a place to compose. There were three other musicians in the camp, a cellist, a violinist, and a clarinetist. And Messiaen wrote his quartet with these specific players in mind. It was performed in January 1941 for 4,000 prisoners and guards in the prison camp. Today is one of the most famous masterworks in the repertoire. Given what we have since learned about life in the concentration camps, why would anyone in his right mind waste time and energy writing or playing music? There was barely enough energy on a good day to find food and water, to avoid a beating, to stay warm, to escape torture. Why would anyone bother with music? And yet, from the camps, we have poetry. We have music and we have visual art. It wasn't this one fanatic Messiaen. Many, many people created art in these camps. Why? Well, in a place where people are only focused on survival, on the bare necessities, the obvious conclusion is that art must be somehow essential to life. The camps were without money, without hope, without commerce, without recreation, without MCAS, without basic respect, but they were not without art. Art is part of survival, art is part of the human spirit, and an unquenchable expression of who we are. Art is, the one, is one of the ways in which many of us say, I am alive and my life has meaning. I know, and this is brief, or at least I hope, that all of you understand the importance of the arts in our world, our children's world, and certainly the community of Northampton. With the addition of 450,000, we saw virtually no change in the return of the arts to the schools. It is clear that we need more funding for our schools, and it will be up to you and the city council to begin preparing the groundwork for an override to support bringing our schools back to where they need to be. I am counting on you as my educational leaders and the leaders of this community to support and override so that we can fund our schools responsibly. Thank you. The uh, final speaker who signed up is Sadia, uh, Sadia Shavan. Sorry if I mangled your first name. My last name gets mangled. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Sadia Shevin, and I live at uh, 8 Cosmian Avenue in Florence. Um, I'm here in tonight in support of continued funding for arts classes in the Northampton Public Schools. I am a clarinetist in the high school band, and having the musical support that comes from being able to go to band class every day is very important to me and is something that I do not want to see changed in any way at the high school. I am also a student who takes a lot of intense academic classes, classes that require me to use critical thinking and memorization skills, different skills from the ones that I'm using when I play clarinet. Band requires me to have a completely different mindset, to use a different part of my brain than the one my other classes expect of me. And this is one of the reasons that band is among my favorite high school classes. It also offers the chance to perform for throughout the school year, a tangible experience that is not found in many high school classes. One of the ideas that I have heard pitched for replacing some of the undersubscribed art courses is to have the, those students do them as senior capstone projects. I am against this idea. These art classes have an intense amount of student-teacher interaction. The capstone project would mean almost no student-teacher action, inter, student interaction. It's like cutting a handwriting class for first graders. Let me explain. I'm sure that many of you remember that when you were in first grade, you had to learn how to have good handwriting. When you learned how to write, your handwriting teacher looked at your work and told you what you were doing wrong and how you could improve. And I'm sure that many of us, including myself, would have much worse handwriting without his or her help. That exact same interaction is found in any course in the arts. The artists of NHS cannot improve themselves without this type of support. Imagine trying to learn handwriting on your own because they cut your first grade handwriting classes. 
That's exactly what it will be like for our art students if these cuts happen. I encourage the school committee to support any action that would prevent these cuts to art courses from taking place at any of the Northampton public schools. Thank you. So that's the completed sign-up list. Was there anyone else who wishes to speak in the public comment? Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, I'm Andrew Cooper. I live at 136 South Main Street in Florence. Um, I just wanted to echo everything everybody said already. Um, I don't really feel like I need to tell anybody here how important the arts are at the schools. I think everybody knows that, and I think everybody is just devastated by the cuts. Um, I do not envy Ms. Athas, Ms. Wilson, any of you here for having to make these decisions. I know they're not something that you want to have to do or feel like are easily decided upon. Um, but I would like to say that I think it's important moving forward that we establish what it means to have a valued education in the public school system. It's not about what we can live, it's not about finding how few courses we can offer and still get a quality education. It's about making sure that an education has all of the parts that create a well-rounded person, including the arts, music, science, English, history, math, all of those subjects are important to learning. And I think it's time that even though we are in these hard times right now with the budget, we think about the future and how do we prevent these cuts from happening again? Because every year there's some sort of cut coming in, uh, you know, and we're coming down to the point where we're cutting busing, we're, we're raising athletic fees, we're cutting teachers, we're really cutting into that core part of our education. And I think it's, it's really important that after we get through this, this bump with the, with the budget right now, that we continue to discuss how in the future we prevent this to the best of our abilities using whatever resources were given from the federal and state government. But how is a school system, how is a community, do we establish what it means to have a well-rounded education as a person? Um, but I really echo everybody's point here and I thank you all for your hard work so far. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we generally do not allow a second uh, public speaking. Um, I think it might be more appropriate if you could just perhaps send us an email or submit the information because we just we just generally allow people one chance to speak and then we we really ask them to come back to a future meeting. But if you'd like to submit an email to us or send the information along, we can distribute it to the committee. Okay. But I also would like to say that I don't believe that the agreement rule and that that rule. But unfortunately, they're the rules that I'm bound to enforce. So I, I thank you. No problem at all. No problem at all. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I believe we'll, that will close our public comment session, and then we will move into the uh, uh, any announcements that anyone has to make this evening. Uh, any announcements? Okay, hearing none, we would then move into the. Uh, uh, primary business item tonight, which is a, uh, a discussion and update on the status of the FY14 budget. Thank you. I'll start uh, the conversation and Mr. McLaughlin will join in as needed. First, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight, for your honesty, for your passion and your comments. Uh, it's always appreciated when I can hear from you and the school committee can hear from you during the public comment period. Uh, it does make a difference. Even though we can't respond to each person, I want you to know that your words are heard and weighed into our decisions. So thank you. I want to uh, touch base on a couple of very important things. Uh, first, to start off with, I want to thank our entire administrative leadership team because we do this budget together and we make these decisions together in a collaborative fashion. Uh, most recently on Tuesday morning as the group met and decided how to reallocate the funds that were given back to us by the city. But as I thank all of our administrators for their work, I want to especially thank Mr. McLaughlin, our business manager, who has worked tirelessly seven days a week, and I can't even count how many hours a day that he's been in working on this, drafting, redrafting, getting down to every dollar, 
um, so that we're trying to remove estimates and get to the actual dollar amounts because we don't want to cut anything we don't have to. And it's because of his attention to detail that we're able to continue to refine this to the place where it is today. So thank you for that. A couple of highlights I want to share with you, as was noted uh, tonight and also in the paper, uh, the mayor has reallocated $450,000 to the school budget. What that means to us, we had uh, most recently a budget gap of $1.225 million. And with this $450,000, we are now covering a gap of $775,000. So it's important to note that we are very excited to have this money back to put in our system. Um, it is not the end of the budget crisis, and I think you all know that and it's important for me to state that. Uh, our initial drafts were as many as, if you added up all of the positions and part-time positions, as many as 27 uh, FTEs or full-time equivalencies. And this budget before you tonight represents somewhere between 16 and 17 full-time equivalencies. Still a large number of people, but reduced from where it was in the first couple of drafts. Two weeks ago, I read through the entire uh, list for you. I'm not going to do that tonight. Uh, you have that in front of you, but I do think it's important that I highlight some of the changes and then open it up to questions. So some of the changes that our team decided to make was to reallocate money for busing, which we had in the last draft, down to busing only children who are in kindergarten through sixth grade. And we now have that busing for kindergarten through eighth grade for students uh, who are further than 1.5 miles away from their school. We have also taken out the furlough day. Uh, the furlough day was something that is certainly not my right to put in there. It's my right to suggest. And of course, the union representation and the union membership would have to vote on a furlough day. Uh, so that wasn't a given anyway. And uh, our team decided that that's something we would want to take out to not negotiate the furlough day with the union membership at this time. We added back a full-time classroom teacher to Jackson Street. We added back one full-time classroom teacher to Leeds. We added back two full-time teachers to JFK Middle School, one in World Language, a point eight in Math Intervention, and a point two in English Language Arts. We added back 1.34 teaching positions at the high school, which included um, electives and special education. We also added back at the high school $5,500 to the supply line. Um, initially, they had cut uh, nearly $29,000 from their supplies, and that's down to $24,000. Still a significant cut in their supplies. But as I explained last time, if you cut the elective classes, which use the most consumable supplies, then you could also cut the supply budget. So adding back those sections, we need to add back money to help uh, the supplies for the students and teachers to make those sections run. And also, we, had re we reinstated the $5,500 for the dual enrollment fund so those students can take advantage of the community college classes. Those are some of the changes. As you'll notice um, in the high school, some of the arts and technology are back. Some of the sections were put back in, but not all of them. So you'll see increases in um, the arts, in technology, video, and photo, one extra section additional sections back to band, chorus, and theater. And so with that, uh, we have a new draft budget that uh, has us within $6,000 of having a balanced budget. Our process from this point is to hear from the school committee tonight. If, this is, if these are the changes that you will support, then we will put together our official budget book for you for two weeks, I believe it's April 11th, that you will officially vote the budget. So we take this working draft and put it into the official budget book as you remember from last year. <coughs> Let me pause for questions, comments. Sorry, Mrs. Minnick. I, I just want to say thank you to you and to your administrative leadership team for working on this. been an arduous task. I'm glad you were given the, the opportunity to add back a few things, but I, I really do appreciate the clarity with which you described everything. Thank you. Mr. Moore. I'm not sure what the proper format for this is, but I would, I, I think I have a motion. I think I would like to move that um, 
in addition to these other cuts that we um, not eliminate the line, but move to zero the line for um, school committee stipend. Second on the motion, so that would be a line item that would be. Um, I assume that would be about 20, 22, uh, 22. Is that? It's not on. It's the not on. Okay. Okay. Not, yeah. Okay. Not, yeah. But that would. Yes. Okay. So that would be to, uh, essentially the equivalent of the stipend times nine members. Correct. Okay. I don't receive a stipend, so. Not, so. I guess I'm confused because the the, um, the fiscal year and the calendar year, which is our terms, don't mm -hmm. coincide. So. That is one of the issues with the elected official stipend because they do run on a calendar year because of when. Uh, the elections take place um, so it would be a if it were for a fiscal year it would be um, essentially for spanning two of those years so it would be it would be one one of the two years of, of the term so it would be for this budget so exactly so yeah. starting um, July, July 1st of 2013 yes. so that would be the clarification we're discussing it now? Most certainly. Okay. Um, I think that um, I believe Mr. Bourne gave back his stipend. That's right. And that's his option to do. And I think any of us here have the option to do it, but I don't believe that it should be taken away. Um, there are certain expenses that come also with being a school committee member um, and expectations. And I know that part of the stipend that I receive goes right back into events that I, uh, I attend or um, the school B, the spelling B, going for the team. I mean, a lot of it already goes back into it, and I don't, I think that each one of us has the right to put it back in there, but what we do is valuable, and our time is valuable, and it doesn't anywhere touch the amount of time that we're doing. It's not a wage, it's a stipend, and um, so I disagree. I would just echo what Ms. DeBall said that, uh, and I think it was admirable what uh, Mr. Bourne did uh, at our last meeting, and we accepted the gift graciously. And in the past, I know um, as a committee member, I've, I've asked the uh, committee to, to give back a percentage of um, our stipends to be in line with what the city uh, and others were doing. And uh, it it should, I believe, be left to an individual to decide if um, they would like to donate back a portion or the entire amount of their stipend. So um, I'm not sure I would be. There's able also to an. Either. I would also say there's. There's also the a sort of a an odd kind of technical legal issue about it because under our charter, um, uh, a body is not allowed to vote on a salary change. Uh, that is not itself. prospect. It has to be. They can't vote to change their salary. It has to be for the future term under our charter. Um, and they, so that would be the. Only, I, I would have to. I would have to. Well, presumably you're thinking it's an inc a decrease. <laughs> increase is what that's designed for. I assume so. But it, it doesn't specify. So I, it's <laughs> just one of those odd quirks that the, the idea is that elected officials aren't supposed to give themselves a raise or. Or mm -hmm. that's the intent that you can make a change like that, but it has to take effect after the next election. Mm -hmm. That's what the charter envisions. So that's just one. I know this issue has come up on the city council before, um, and what we ended up having to do was we voluntarily, some of us just get donated back our, because legally we weren't actually allowed to vote to <coughs> ch sort of to change the salary of the city council um, mid mid term. So that would be the only. Again, it's a one. Just it's more of a uh, 
technicality, if you will, but that is the one issue with that. Um, that we it's happened on the city council before. I'd like to speak in support of my motion. Um, I think that what you have said about it being a stipend is exactly right. It's um, it's a token amount. It's a it's a you know it has a symbolic value, rhetorical value, saying you know we do value this. We do understand you're working here. That you know this is not while you know it's public service and voluntary that there are costs associated with it. And so it's a it's a it's a nod towards that. But precisely because it's a token amount, I think. It's not a token amount when aggregated. You know that it, for each one of us individually, it is it's it's real money. But it is um, when aggregated, it is um, we can look at it. Um, it would be a full-time technology video photo teacher, as opposed to a half-time. Or a 0.75 as opposed to 0.34 music band teacher. In other words, it's a substantial, actual, real thing in terms of the education of our students. And I think that um, as a budget does reflect our values, if we, um, I think it's worthwhile having that be reflected in the budget. It's already not equitable as far as it goes. If we're talking about that, there's certain members that get health insurance and others don't. I mean, there's the whole amount of value there. So, I mean, if anything, we could look at the health insurance aspect of it. But once again, I'd like to reiterate that it is a stipend. Our time is still worth something. And if we're going to advocate for teachers and, and principals and our administrators for salaries and increases and raise, then to take away something it just doesn't seem right. I mean, it seems that we should probably take it to wherever we have to take it and discuss the compensation. I'd be all for that, especially since some people get health insurance through it and choose to do that and other people don't. So the compensation and the, and the amount that it costs the city is different depending on whether or not you take the health insurance or don't. So um, I just want to say that. I'd like to call the question because I think this is sidetracking us from the, the the discussion that we really need to be focused on. I think this is a new issue rather than talking about the proposal that's brought in front of us. I don't think it's, it's not worthy of discussion, but I don't think this is the day for it. I think we have a lot. So to there's been a motion to call the question. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, all in favor of calling the question, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So uh, the question is called. So the motion for you is to um, is to I believe it's to zero out the uh, the line item for uh, school committee stipends and effectively transfer that to the general school committee budget. Effect. Okay. Right. It would change to the tools. Okay. So all those in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. 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 Okay, I believe the nays have it. The motion does not carry. Um, so we're back to again the discussion, the general discussion of the budget and the uh, the question that the superintendent has put before us in terms of the new newly realigned uh, cuts and uh, the allocations that have been made to the uh, each of the schools. And I think he's seeking comment from you in terms of uh, these cuts as he then. We'll try to put them into the full line item budget that would be submitted for consideration at the next meeting. Mr. Uh, I, have a, just, I have a question about the reduced spent legal expenses, thirty thousand dollars of the district wide. I think that's the first time that I think that's the first time that's shown up here. I'm just wondering where that came from and how that that's correct. That came from our discussion again with our leadership team and a review of our expenses. The legal expenses in special education, I believe the full line amount is $60,000. And uh, it was recommended by our special education director that we could cut that in half based on the fact that she hasn't utilized the legal expenses as much as they have been in the past because of her own work and her experience and knowledge in negotiating and mediating things. She's been able to control <coughs> the expense line significantly. So she feels we can move forward with about half of what we proposed for this year. Ms. Pick. I'd like to ask a background question before we talk more about the budget. Can you um, 
um, explain to us how you determined how much of the health insurance savings you um, what? distributed to the schools? And I have to caution because it's uh, again I've said I've tried to be clear about this. Uh, you know, this is a proposal that I've put forward <coughs> under the new health insurance reform uh, law that the city council adopted. <clears throat> and so um, we've we've uh, put a proposal out. We we're going to begin a formal process of meeting uh, with our employees um, and retirees to, to work through that process. Um, but that's uh, project essentially the the increase that we were looking at, which was about a 10% increase. Um, if you factor in the impact of moving to the GIC January 1st, the the um, the result of that is the increase is kept to only about one percent. So that's sort of the, so it's it's the the gap got a little smaller that nine hundred thousand um, dollars. I think the other thing that what I have to remind you though is as I've talked to you before and when I laid out my initial numbers in January and then when I um, went out to all of my departments, including the school department, to say give me a level funded budget, um, it was sort of with the full knowledge that uh, that we were still out of whack even with a level funded budget um, that we were still there were uh, we were needing to address other uh, deficits and that um, so I was asking because I didn't want to begin by saying cut uh, I wanted to see if we could try to make up those differences in other ways including with health care um, including looking at state aid and so when we so we have to be cautious with that $900,000 because we're trying to fill kind of that larger uh, gap that, that, that we're dealing with as well. So part, in part in caution because of the fact that we still have to go through this process with our, with our employees and retirees and also because of this larger gap that I'm trying to address, this was the most that I felt, and, I'm, and again, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not reallocating to any other department uh, I'm trying to meet all of our requirements, all of our fixed costs, and I'm trying to also give additional funding to the schools. So that's what I'm authorizing, knowing that this vote is coming up and knowing that this is the opportunity to do that. There may be additional as we move through that process because there's still um, <clears throat> an open question about how much, uh, um, what the FY14 impact could be at the end of that um, process. And again, if there's additional funds, my goal would be to try to p put more funds back into bu into city budgets, but that was sort of the the rationale for how I came up with that number. And it's it may even not be conservative enough, but it's I wanted to give the most that I could give to the schools at this point who are facing the largest cuts, and still be able to uh, backfill some of those other areas that we are in gap on. Um, so we're still we're still. We're still looking at four positions in the police department that we haven't figured out a way how we're going to fill those, and we've got other, uh, you know, the pension obligations that we have to meet, and all those other things that I laid out to you. All those other fixed costs, um, are, I can't cut. I can't say I'm not going to make that contribution to the pension uh, board. That's a required cost. I can't, you know, say sorry we're cutting that. So I there's some of those things that I have to meet, and so I was attempting to give everyone a level funded budget um, and, and try to work through those other gaps. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we're going to be able to send some money, but we have to fill all those larger gaps as well. I know that's sort of a complicated answer, but um, it's, it's the best I can give you. And in the last two weeks, has there been any further information coming from the state? That you can share well, in terms of the state, um, and then one of the other issues with the uh, you know, with we, we, we have actually backed off on, on our revenue project. Well, there have been some changes in the revenue area, some good, some bad. Um, it's pretty much now kind of been universally accepted by most cities and towns that we, we don't want to use the, full, the governor's full projection of, of local aid uh, because a chunk of his local aid is dependent on uh, his tax package. And we're expecting there will be su substantial changes to the tax package is what we're hearing from the House. Um, the House budget is supposed to be introduced on April 10th, so a week from next Wednesday. Um, and that will be the clear, that will probably give us sort of our, our, our best look at what state aid could be. And they've had a meeting yesterday. They're, they're, they met 
uh, as a more as a caucus than as a body and to talk about the, the, the various proposals and what the speaker thinks he can bring forward. There's still discussion of raising additional revenues. There's still discussion about uh, transportation and I guess higher education, but it's still undetermined what they would do. My sense is that the chapter 70 number is not going to change because that's a formula that was set and 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 they're basically plugging in money to that formula and we're a community that does not get additional aid under that formula um, and so we're kind of a minimum aid community in that regard so we'll get the $25 per kid extra uh, that, the, that the chapter 70 formula envisions and um, and that's what we'll most likely get uh, the other the only other piece would be local aid if they increase local aid or give an, a, an additional infusion of local aid but again uh, you know I, realistically that could be in the tens of thousands um, uh, I wouldn't expect it to be in the hundreds of thousands uh, but that's kind of the last piece that will that I'll be looking at uh, to know for sure what our gap is at at this point um, as we move forward <clears throat> If I may uh, clarify uh, what I'm looking for at tonight's meeting is uh, any final, hopefully final input on the budget from school committee as a whole board. Uh, we do this working draft copy because as I've mentioned before, it changes every single day. And now our next step is the 50 to 70 page budget book that we put together to present to you in April. And we would hope for your support forwarding that, knowing that we've gone through this lengthy process and you've had many times to look at the budget. So um, if there are any changes or new directions you would like for us to take in developing this budget, I'd like to hear it tonight so we can go back and make those changes. Because hopefully in April, when it's time for me to present this budget, you will have all felt that you had enough input and enough time to review it that you'll be able to vote it and not send us back to make changes once we have the final document produced. So with that in mind, um, what we've seen has addressed changes. And just looking back at the FY13, I just, to satisfy myself that I've looked at every single line item, um, the business office has a budget of $284,669. I don't see any reductions in that function. I'm not saying that they're possible, but I just want to make sure that they've been considered, even a partial, right? Even going, we've taken teachers who we've heard are really <coughs> critical to the education of the young people in our town, and we're cutting them back from a 0.67 to a 0.34 or a point, you know, 1 to a 0.9. Um, is there any opportunity for any kind of savings there? District-wide maintenance, 374,312. So again, 5% um, reduction. Uh, in that department could fund you know half of a teaching position um, if in fact that's been investigated but that's you know from what I've seen I understand that the administrative leadership team is working with what's going on mostly within their buildings or with the preschool and kindergarten functions you know early childhood edu education um, but I haven't seen an analysis or a lot of movement around those other functions, which you need to have a, a functioning school system, but I just wanted to make sure that they had been, even partial reductions had been addressed. I'm glad you asked that question because I haven't addressed that, but it has been a part of our discussion in our administrative leadership team. Uh, you're correct that the reduction to a secretarial position in the central office, uh, there is only one position that has been cut and we've combined the responsibilities of the secretary and special education with our school committee clerk going forward. We did review all the positions and see if there, if we could find savings or a way to reduce responsibilities or, you know, efforts and work in order to reduce positions. The thought was that, and the comments that I heard from the group is that there are certain areas in our district that have been reduced over time, and secretaries and custodians are an area that have been cut in the past to the point where we really can't go in that direction any longer and which is why we're at the teacher level with this budget um, they feel that they we feel that we're at a really a skeleton crew with the support staff in the central office and within the school buildings too we didn't want to cut any more secretarial time because we really are barely getting the work done with the personnel that we have 
And so uh, you will see that in maintenance, we are going to try to get by with one less custodian district wide. So we have looked at all the areas and we did not determine that we had uh, had the ability to make cuts in those in those staffs. Thank you. Are there other uh, any other comments or input for the superintendent and Mr. McLaughlin? <coughs> I guess um, it's sort of what we're seeing is cuts that are heavily concentrated on what I cringe when they're called non-core subjects um, because as been demonstrated by the, the incredibly articulate and, and well-reasoned testimony from members of our community over the past several meetings, these are for many members of our community the core <coughs> of what they get and I just I understand that there's no free lunch and that restoring any of these positions means that English classes would be larger or math classes would be larger um, but I really when I see this disproportionate concentration over this group it it troubles me um, because we have lost so much of again music the fine arts technical arts languages um, and again always because they're not defined as the core mission I mean we've even gotten to the point in public education where we're beginning to define science and history and social studies as not being part of the core mission um, where English language arts and mathematics are driving those subjects to the periphery. And as a science teacher, a person living in a society which desperately needs more scientific literacy, that is somewhat frightening. So I, I know that there's no way to make this better, and um, I'm hoping that an override will provide some opportunity to bring some things back if it's successful uh, and if the community can mobilize to make that happen but uh, at the same time I'm, I, I, want, I just have an open question in my mind whether, there, whether I don't see any English mathematics history I don't see any of those and um, I don't even see a slight reduction um, you know uh, pulling back to a 0 0.9 or 0 0.75 and I understand that's a significant hardship on that individual but again, in evaluating what we do as a system, um, this is difficult to, to look at. Um, I wasn't sure that this was the time to make the statement I wanted to make, but um, I'll try to be as eloquent as Downey. I don't think I can. <clears throat> in previous meetings, I've talked about how disheartened and sad I am. And I think I've gotten to the point where I'm more angry, and I'm really angry at a state that tells us that we have to mandate academics, but not the non-academics. So we heard um, when, when our high school students had their rally um, last week, which was, they did that in such a, such a wonderful and respectful way. Uh, I really congratulate them on that. Um, and the superintendent was interviewed, and he commented on, on how, um, how difficult it is to make the choices to cut the arts, but the fact is that the state mandates how many hours we have to have in the core, what they call the core academic subjects. And I'm really angry that the arts and the, the non-academics are not included in what the state thinks is vital and should be part of our core academics. So that we are in this position every year where we you know where we we put our some of some of our most valuable staff members 
kind of on hold every year worrying for their jobs. We put the students you know, in this anxious position wondering if these courses, which are so important to them, and I can speak as a parent whose you know, son would not have made it through without music and a daughter who just loves what she does in, um, in, in chorus and art. But, and and I, not just speaking for me, I just know how vital this is in our community. And the fact that the state doesn't support us in being able to provide those for our students in a stable way every year is just, just really unnerving and um, uh, just incomprehensible to me. I mean, we're, we are you know, no, known as a state that, that values education, but how we define education is really limited. And I think one of our students actually said that we need to you know, uh, um, establish what we value in education, but not just here in Northampton. Um, I have said in the past that I do not favor um, a proposition two and a half override for things that aren't concrete. I believe in overrides. I've always said that I believe in overrides for something where, where the citizens of the city and not just the people invested in our schools can see what their money is buying, whether it's a building, you know, like a police building, the fire station, in addition to the high school or the middle school, whatever we've done in the past years. And I've had no, no choice but to change my perspective on this because the state is hamstringing us every time we turn around and not allowing us to do what we need to do as a school department for our district. And um, I would like to ask that we have um, um, a, a, on our agenda next time to be discussing where we stand on an override. And I'm going to tell you now that I have definitely changed my mind. I will support an override for as long as the state does not allow us to, um, to tax us in a way that allows us to, to provide the education that we need for our students. Could we just speak to um, the custodial position at uh, JFK with the building closure on the weekends um, and where that currently stands? I, I, I would speak to the high school busing as well. There, there's groups that will be impacted, and I think I'll just keep my comments to the, the JFK building closure and, and what we do to the public access to the pool that so many people in town have come to enjoy and uh, rely on for their um, their workouts, physical fitness, and um, the fact that um, when JFK uh, had the renovation, we um, sold the pool part of it as a community uh, resource for all, and it really has become that, and people have come to use it, and with schedules being what they are, um, there are folks that just come and use it on the weekend because that's when their hours are most flexible to come and enjoy that resource that um, they've come to expect that we offer here in Northampton. And I am concerned about um, limiting that access to not only our students but to the general public. And I know there was some discussion as to how we might be able to speak to um, the Recreation Department to see if they could somehow help with the fees that they charge to cover a custodian that might be able to uh, keep the pool area open. And I didn't know if there was any further discussion or movement on that. Uh, you raise a very good point, one that I'm concerned about as well, because this building is very full on Saturdays and Sundays, and families really enjoy this as a community resource. Uh, when we're looking at what we need to do to reduce our costs, the as a school district, we fund the cost of the custodian on weekends, and rather than cut from somewhere else in our classroom or in our buildings, we felt that that is someplace that we could no longer fund. However, we don't want to see the building close on weekends either, and we're hoping that there will be uh, some way that the rec department will be able to stay open and maybe support the cleaning and maintenance um, through through their department. I'm not sure if they'll be able to do that. They run on a shoestring budget just like we do. Uh, but we felt that's a place we need to cut. And uh, we do hope that there's a way we can support the building being open without us supporting the custodian. In regards to the high school busing, since we're just, uh, since I'm bringing up a few things, I've mm -hmm. had this chicken or the egg conversation mm -hmm. with a few people and uh, there are 
a few students and again we know how full the buses are that come to the high school and it's been part of our discussions uh, in other areas on the school committee but there are some students who um, rely on the bus to get to school and I've had conversations that include um, you know the, the, it'll be good for uh, students and families to figure out how to get to school on time other than using public or uh, uh, the, the, the school bus transportation um, we can get kids to school and have very large class sizes uh, we can get or we can't get kids to school to get educated and for some student out there I know it'll be the difference for them getting to school and graduating and I enjoyed hearing from uh, the public and the students who came this evening and said that there was a teacher out there that made a difference in their life and if it wasn't for him or her they wouldn't have graduated I'm I'm worried about the student who can't get to school and not graduate because they have no transportation or support network at home that would allow them to get to school and take advantage of um, the education that we offer in town so again I know these are hard line items here but I think um, they're also worth just remembering and if we can find any way to to support them I, I would like to see us do that thank you mr. my so um, just to, again the certified occupational therapy assistant is being eliminated but then so it's being reduced to a point eight occupational therapist at Jackson Street School and I was just wondering is that is that something that we feel we can staff because in the past with things like speech language pathology we've had tremendous difficulty in actually hiring people within the district and then we're left with mm -hmm. providing the services through contract services which are often more expensive and since these are part of an IEP that we're legally obligated to provide the services I was wondering in terms of your discussions with the director of special education are, you know, are, the, are all of these modifications, and that's just one of them. There are many modifications and um, reconfiguration of looks like delivery of services of speech language pathology, um, and are these things going to be affected in a way that delivers the savings? Because if they can't be, then we'll have a situation where later on in the year we'll be forced to make additional cuts. You are absolutely right with your analysis of that. Uh, in the past, there have been times where we couldn't staff the position, so we had to hire consultants, which cost much more than providing the services through our own staffing. The way that this has been configured by our special education team was to create positions that are large enough, so in the past, if we had a point three position, it's impossible to fill. We tried to create positions that would be attractive enough, a point eight, an 80% position is one that we will get applicants for. And these, uh, these changes, which may seem odd to the person who doesn't fully understand our staffing, these changes are designed to do just what you've said. We're eliminating lines and the uh, um, budget lines for consultants and putting it back into staffing and that will have a net result of savings so when you see you know special education cuts and the total amount of whatever X hundred thousand dollars it is that is not a reduction in services in many cases is an improvement of services with our staffing in-house and a reduction in outside consultants so yes we've spent a lot of time analyzing these positions and uh, Lori Farkas has been in this business a long time she knows the market she knows a lot of people who are in the market for positions and she is proposing positions that she believes she'll have qualified candidates for Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ball? I have a question on Ryan Road um, the reducing of the P teacher um, to 1.0 to point eight. Mm -hmm. um, Will the children there get less physical education than at the other schools where I don't see that being cut? Mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, the point eight is the need for uh, PE for all the students at Ryan Road. And what we have been able to do the past two years is add a point two so the PE teacher could do extra electives. Uh, now we'll have to reduce that and meet just the needs of all the kids in PE. So it'll be the because same as the Because it's a smaller school, school okay. they'll be able to get by with a point eight rather than a 1.0. Okay, and um, I'm also really concerned about the arts being cut because there are students that rely 
on the arts as far as self-confidence, as far as who they are as people, as far as getting to learn who they can be, the creative aspect. Some kids get through school, um, like the very articulate Sawyer driver Schroeder stated that he made it through school because of the arts. And he's not the only child student that I know of that has said that to me. I've had a lot of students say that they're not doing well in their academic classes and then that's what saves them and makes them want to go back to school. Yeah. And while I'm concerned about kids getting to school at the high school, I'm concerned about the kids who don't want to come to school any longer because they don't feel like they can be successful because we're taking what I think are core courses, but obviously are not core courses, um, the arts, and cutting them and music. They're very important to people. And we're known as what, one of the top 100 in arts in the country or something. We've been in. So, what do you have to say then? Well, that question, right? exactly. I mean, I but, like, like Mr. Meyer that. said, though, that we aren't cutting any of the core, we're just cutting. It's, to me, it's disproportionate the um, amount of the arts that we're cutting <laughs> compared to others. That's all I'd like to mm -hmm. say. Ms. Beck? Um, I have a subject that I want to raise, and I'm a little concerned about how to be politically correct in doing it. <laughs> okay. so I'm, I'm prefacing it that. Um, and especially since I sit on the negotiating team, um, you made a decision to take the furlough day off the table, and I know this is a negotiable item, and I, I hate to put anything into a budget that means putting the unions on the spot before we've had a chance to vet it out there. But I'm wondering if you are, ha, ha, did you and the team, dis, and the administrative team make a decision that that's not something that we should discuss? Or do you think that's still something that is something that we can discuss when we meet with, with our unions? And I don't, I, I'm, do you have to help me out here? Because I know we don't negotiate in public. We have, this isn't something that we have discussed yet. And I'm just curious kind of how we got to that decision because that, that one furlough day was $105,000. I can explain to you how we came to this decision. Uh, and I want to point out as well, every single one of these lines has a lot of discussion behind it and a lot of math behind it. <coughs> there are no quick decisions made in our administrative team. We know that. So Just asking for some when we were talking about the furlough day, first, it's something that's beyond our control. Right. But second, we have enjoyed um, the past two years of a rather positive morale in our school district. We have a great relationship between teachers and administrators. We have a high level of collegiality going on in our schools. This budget in and of itself fractures that to some extent. And we want to do all that we can to uh, pull each other close in this hard time and not push each other away. And in pulling each other close, I mean working as a system. Working as a system that cares about each other and wants to build an unpalatable budget and do so in a way that doesn't hurt our relationships with each other or our collegiality as much as we can. Uh, we felt that putting the all of the employees, because the furlough day wasn't just the teachers, it was for every employee, putting every employee in a position of voting a uh, furlough day in order to balance the budget uh, was not a place that we were willing to go right now and not a risk we were willing to take either budgetarily or um, for the positive climate that we have. So after a lot of thought and discussion about that, we decided to put that back in and also feel that maybe it's not um, the next step wouldn't be for us to recommend it, but if the union membership decided that something they wanted to bring forward, we would let them make that decision and not force that decision. Did that answer your question? Ms. Yeah. Okay. So are there any other um, questions or comments <coughs> about this? Uh, they made the decision. We can get pretty much all about the way back uh, in. Proposal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And obviously, if you if there are other f questions or 
comments you're open to hearing them and actually no okay i want to be clear with that okay. you know tonight is for that if individual emails between now and the next 10 days while we're developing the budget yeah. book will not be helpful i just meant questions <laughs> yeah. questions yeah. Yeah. it will not emails. be helpful. questions yeah. we need to have final okay. decisions made so we can produce that booklet which takes a number of days to put okay. together yeah. okay i have just a, a clarifying question under the northam high school and we've talked about the elimination of cheerleading uh, to date, on all the drafts I've seen, it said eliminate cheerleading, and now you have the stipends word put in there. I don't, I'm not sure it was there last time. Um, I'm just wondering, and I know it's a small <coughs> group of cheerleaders at the high school, and that's why it's been targeted for elimination. Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility that we could have a, a volunteer uh, come in and do some of the work with the girls or find a way that there could be a club that could exist to kind of encompass some of what I'm sure a few girls and boys out there still might want to participate in. It's a good question. If stipends wasn't there in previous drafts, it was intended was it? to be. It's the same. I have both. Yeah. Okay. It was intended to be. Okay. Uh, but to answer your question, we do have some volunteer clubs. We have a fencing club. Uh, we have other clubs that community members come in and volunteer. The tricky part there is with the volunteer club, they are often not eligible for MIAA competition. And so our cheerleading squad would not be a varsity sport. It would be a club instead, and that would change its attractiveness for many students. And I do stand corrected. I'd see it on the last draft. The draft, it does say stipends. Mr. Moore. Yeah, the question is not really my question, but the question that I get asked frequently, I wanted to know if it can, if it can figure in this year's budget in terms of the consideration is the question of Reconfiguring, restructuring, closing, you know, whatever, the, uh, our whole school district. Yeah. Closing the whole school district? No. Okay. <laughs> so I'll make sure I'm still awake. Um, that discussion has come up a number of times in our meetings, and we do think that that is worth looking at. Um, probably not for next year, but for the future, uh, as we've been told, the budget situation the outlook for the next two or three years does not look as if it's much better and those are pretty drastic changes that may need to be considered um, well, I think we should lean on the work that was done in the past there's uh, quite a bit of work that was done by school committee members I believe there was a subcommittee who also worked with Susan Wright to evaluate and analyze that and put those numbers together I think we could dig up that work uh, establish a new subcommittee of the school committee if you wish to investigate that for a future year, but that's not our recommendation for September. Mr. Schell. Um What you said really struck a chord because I think one of the most depressing things about looking at this is knowing that this is just one step on a long path, that it's going to be continuing like this for a long time. Um, that was that was one thing you said that made me a little bit sad. But but another thing you said that I, I, that a couple people said that that do make me give me a little bit of hope is that uh, uh, I do think that we as a community can come together in a way that makes sense for us to try to address some of these cuts. And I know that Miss Pick said we should set a special meeting to talk about an override or put that on the agenda. And work not a special meeting, put on the agenda next time. And I think. Um, that is something that that's really the only solution that we can come up with right now as a way to work our way out of the problem for this year and put ourselves in a better position long term. Just wanted to say that. Okay. Mr. Meyer. The superintendent's made it abundantly clear that this is the time to <laughs> ask all questions. Um, could you explain to me the, the structure of the dual enrollment program at the high school and how many students are served by that program? Mm -hmm. and, and just walk me through, uh, again, the addition back of anything is great, but it's all, always at the expense of mm -hmm. many of these other vital things. So what was your logic and the team's logic in doing that? As I expressed in the last meeting, the students who desire the dual enrollment courses at community college and mostly take advantage of that to cut funding for it, we would still allow them to do that. Mm -hmm. But if we cut the funding for it, we're, sent, we're, we're really cutting the opportunity for those students to do that. And we feel like our, our lower income students get hit the most by any of these budget cuts. And we wanted to ameliorate 
that pain as much as we could. And this is something that those kids um, who use it um, get great benefit from and are very excited about. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that a principal, Nancy Athis, was the first one to say that that was something so valued by the kids she wanted that back in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But you did ask more, I'm sorry, you had more to that question, uh, how many students and I'm... Um, You're if about 15, about 15. 15 students are able yeah. to do. Plus or minus one or two the last time I saw the numbers. And, and has it been the experience that these are students who will matriculate at the community colleges and then use that to their advantage in terms of adv completing a degree and having that already paid for? Right. These are students who are getting, um, getting a taste of community college, getting excited about that, and looking to going into community college full time when they graduate. <coughs> Mr. Shelf. Um, just following up on <coughs> the custodian at the JFK. So, if the building is that means the building will be closed on weekends, not just the pool. Is that what we're talking about? Or, so then, well, what it would mean is that we wouldn't fund the custodian in order to keep the building open on weekends. Okay. We support the building being open on weekends. We just can't financially support it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Which likely means the city will need to find a way to, to do that, or we'll have to come up with some. Well, so I, like suburban basketball, for instance, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that they're paying some fee towards. That would be my. That was that was one of my questions. Is that I know that part of the rec fees go to support right. the access to the building. It's very difficult because the recreation department doesn't make money. Um, they charge a very low fee for people because they want people to come in and they know if they raise the fee then people have to think twice before they come to play basketball or go swimming so it will be very difficult for the rec department we can't just shift the cost to them and, and say and absorb it i know you're not saying that i want to clarify mostly for people at home <laughs> but um you know i was the coach of a, of a youth team this year we used a school facility and we one of the things we had to do was pay for the custodians mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that, that what's in here would not preclude that same arrangement right. from happening. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be a structure that we would welcome. Yeah. Am, am I right that part of the reason why the cost of the keeping this school open is because it's the entire school that is open? In other words, is, or would it be a lower cost to keep open the gym and pool if we could close off, you know, the the two hallways that go away from there, you know, down towards the cafeteria and into the rest of the school? What you're saying would seem logical, but whether we have a group merely in a small theater in a building or a group in seven areas of a building, you need to have a custodian available for any emergencies that would go on and for locking up and security before and after the event. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to state that although it seems that as a school committee, we're taking away from um, JFK, uh, I mean, from the rec department and closing it. There's an awful lot that we still do pay for. I mean, and just to be reminded of that, we, we pay for all of the maintenance of the pool and everything else. I mean, we're just take, talking about one position that to be transferred. It's not that we're asking the rec department to pay for, you know, a percentage of the maintenance of the pool or the chemicals or. <laughs> I think that. <laughs> shot my mouth off but I mean I I feel like that it hasn't been looked at in nearly 20 years I I think that there were agreements that when we first did the renovation of this building but I'm not sure that since that time that we have looked at what our actual maintenance costs were <laughs> and whether it's been you know spread evenly the way it should have what the use I, I don't know what the usage is what just to be sure the school does use the pool yeah. so I, I want to be clear that I'm the school does use the pool <laughs> athletics and we're, yeah we're yeah over. I'm saying I don't but the school has m taken on 100% of the maintenance costs mm -hmm. for the pool and we've replaced that thing on the roof mm -hmm. twice now I think, yeah. in, in yep. the last five years so I mean I, I think that we need to look at the regular maintenance, the long-term maintenance, Certainly. and mm -hmm. some of the other associated costs and see if, I, I, do, I think it's not inappropriate after 20 years to reevaluate. I, I think that's great, it's just you have to understand that we're talking about the same pool of money, whether mm -hmm. this, it were, you know, the same not enough pool of money, not to be punny about this, if, but, if it, money, but except, the, uh, except but, that, yeah. that the recreation department does charge a fee. Mm -hmm. You're and correct. So the fees could be Increased. I mean, we're, Most certainly. We're increasing fees for mm -hmm. athletic 
participation mm -hmm. in the schools. Mm -hmm. The recreation department could increase their fees to cover. And that's that's so definitely something. I'm not something saying it's pretty. I don't. I'm mm -hmm. not. I, please don't write me a hundred letters and tell me I'm a bad person. But I'm just saying we should. I think we have a, an obligation mm -hmm. to be looking at. I agree with you. What, the, what our expenses have been for maintenance over the last 20 years, and see if some if if we underestimated or overestimated it. Maybe maybe okay. we should be refunding money to the rec department. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Careful what you ask. <laughs> <laughs> so You're alive, Miss so, Minnick. Uh, I, I think that's definitely a good conversation yeah. to have. Um, certainly. Any other comments or, or questions for the superintendent? Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. I guess this is for the super. No, I don't know. It might be for the public or for the rest of the committee. Um, you know, just this this discussion about the JFK pool and closing. You know, it reminds me of those. There was some story I got read when I was a small child about a family that had a certain amount of firewood, and it was a very cold winter, and they burned up all their firewood, and then they started throwing all their furniture into the fireplace, and then they started tearing down the house and throwing it into the fireplace. Um, I feel like that's where we are in this discussion. You know that. At some point, we need to stop and do something else. And um, clearly, that's on a short-term basis. That's the override. Clearly, on a longer-term basis, we have to get our two lines to be on the same slope. We cannot continue either. It's either that or have overrides on a very periodic basis. Because unless our ability to spend money increases as fast as our need to spend money we will be having the same discussion over and over again. So um, I, I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we're clearly at the point where we're throwing an awful, we're starting to throw things like our doors into the, into the fireplace. <laughs> yeah. And um, we really need to uh, reconsider that. I, and, I, and there was a great forum here, which some of you attended about with Representative Cocott, and a lot of the discussion was about local revenue. And the fact that we, you know, we've done it, you know, they gave us that 0.75 meals tax, we adopted that. They gave us the hotel motel, we adopted that. They gave us health insurance reform, which we had, have adopted and we're going to utilize that. But there really needs to be more local revenue options. If you're going to continue to just keep giving us less or the same amount of local aid, we have all these fixed costs that are going up. Somebody asked about the meals tax. Uh, David Murphy made a really great point about, you know, you know, they gave us that 0.75, you know, could they share more of that? We ran an analysis for him. Um, so in FY12, you know, that 0.75% that we get to collect, the local share, uh, was about $700,000. Um, the state collected about $5.5 million. That was their share of it. Um, so on our meals tax. So in <coughs> Hampton, our Northampton is generating, we figure, about $87 million uh, worth of, of revenue in FY12, of which we get to keep. Um, because, we, because they uh, you know, gave us the local option of saying we could keep it, and many communities haven't adopted this. It's, uh, many communities are scared to adopt it. They don't want to adopt it because it's a tax. So we're, collecting, you know, we're getting to keep uh, a whopping $700,000. Of uh, of the of the taxes, and again, the state gets 5.49 million of it. So, um, so, uh, so you know, that's the that's the unequal equation that we have to try to address. We have to try to get the state to give us more local revenue options. I realize that doesn't help us for July one. Uh, you know, we only have one real local revenue option generator, but we have to say if you're not, you know. If you're, if, if you're not really going to be a relevant part of our budget process anymore and we can't count on, uh, on you, then you have to give us more tools to generate revenue locally. And that's sort of where we are. So am I correct that we are voting our budget next meeting? So I, I have um, obviously some pretty serious concerns about how to do that. Um, in, we've had some horrific budget seasons before. But we've been able to get it to a point where we can make some semblance of peace with the choices that we're making. With no disrespect intended to the process that the administrative team has gone through, we, we've gotten to a point where you can't really support these choices anymore. How are we supposed to vote on a budget like this? I don't quite understand how I can, how I can vote on a budget that's, that's cutting out as much as we are. 
and so the superintendent and the administrators are you know proposing what they think are the best choices for their schools and the best choices that they have to offer us stink <laughs> so what happens if we don't vote the budget we would start <laughs> it's my responsibility to present a balanced budget to you mm -hmm regardless of if it Sorry. smells bad or not. <laughs> so I, I have to present a balanced budget to you and you will vote that uh, if it's a responsible balanced budget for the city to put into their balanced budget. Um, you can take it from there. And, and I have an <laughs> obligation under the charter to present a balanced budget to the city council by May 17th. I don't, and, and I have to do that. And, and so that's why I have to ask all my all the departments and the school departments to submit their information and it all has to come to balance. I understand yeah. all that. I mean, I've been doing right. this yeah. my 12th time now. So I understand all that. But it's also our responsibility to vote on a budget that we can support. When it gets to the point where we don't have the funds to create a budget that we can support, mm -hmm. seriously, what happens if we well, don't pass it? What happens is, you know, I will need to still submit a number uh, for the school department as part of my budget and because uh, really your your authority the, the authority of our body is to make is to the city council passes that larger number and it's your authority to make the decisions about how that so, so we vote allocated. on the bottom line well you're and voting the book, the book is written but it doesn't mean I know you don't want to hear this but it doesn't mean we can't change things around after the facts well, he's not going to like that, but, <laughs> but say for example, but say for example, I you know between now and May 17th, we have there's some change, and I'm you know I can certainly increase the overall appropriation to to, to various line items in the budget I submit, mm -hmm. and that just means you're going to get basically m m your appropriation is going to be larger than what you initially budgeted for, and then it'll be up to the school committee and the superintendent to figure out how to reallocate that. Then I would propose an amended budget based on the new numbers. Yeah. In the meantime, and I know there's no answer for this, how do we offer any sense of security to those people that we want to be able to keep in our system and haven't figured out how to do yet and aren't maybe not be able to figure out until we have a vote for an override or not? I have no good I answer. Didn't, I didn't think I you no did. I'm just, I guess yeah. it's a rhetorical question. It but. Are we having fun yet? So if I may just be so bold as to offer my advice or uh, suggestion, uh, if school committee decides that an override is something we want to support, that we try to do it in a positive way so that the override is what we wish for our schools, how we believe our schools should be, what we believe the community wants from their schools, and I think that would be the way to go forward. Um, I know it's tempting to say, to, to go the opposite way and say, this is what's cut if you don't vote the override. And I don't believe that that fear of that threat of cut is the, the right direction to go for a campaign. Last year, we spent some time having a lot of fun in administrative leadership team and with our school councils, building a budget of what we felt was an educationally sound budget. What we, what we dreamed the world of our schools could be and should be. And so though that was larger than I believe we would propose for an override, I believe that's the spirit we should use in proposing an override if you decide to do that. Are there any other comments or questions? Or? Okay. So I think then uh, we can move on. Uh, then there's no new business that I'm aware of. Um, obviously our next meeting, uh, where we'll be discussing that uh, that detailed budget book will be Thursday, March 11th at 7:15 here at the JFK oh, April. April. Sorry, it says March on the uh, agenda. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> April 11th, 7:15. Uh, um, and other than that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any abstentions? <laughs>